This is Audible. Their Brazen Bride, Bridgewater Menage, Volume Eight, written by Vanessa Vale, narrated by Kylie Stewart. Prologue, Abigail. I will kill her now. Paul Grimsby cocked the gun, the sound of it making me jump. Or you can save her. You decide. He had the look of a man not to be trifled with. Tall and lean, he seemed as if he'd been stretched on a medieval rack. His curly hair was tamed with pomade, and the cut of his suit was the latest fashion. But he was anything but a gentleman. Especially since he held a gun to my friend's head. I glanced over my shoulder at the man. One of Mr. Grimsby's oversized and brutish lackeys, who blocked the room's only exit. What? What is it you want from me, exactly? My voice was shrill with nerves. Sweat trickled down between my breasts. I wrung my hands as my knees practically knocked. I hadn't been invited to the Grimsby house. I'd been accompanied by the man at the door, and another who had ventured off somewhere in the big house. The journey across Butte from my finishing school was only ten blocks or so, but it had felt interminable. I'd spent the time considering ways to escape them. I was walking down a busy street. Screaming I was being kidnapped was at the top of the list of possibilities, but the two henchmen who'd flanked me had warned if I so much as waved to someone on the street, my school friend Tennessee Bennett would be killed. I remember the first time I met her commented on her unusual name. She'd said her parents named her and her two sisters after states. Georgia and Virginia were fine names, but she'd been burdened with Tennessee, a definite mouthful. Money, of course, he replied evenly. A clock on the mantel over the fireplace chimed the hour. The room was so civilized, but the conversation was anything but. It seemed Mr. Grimsby had every intention to do so. Kill Tennessee, that was. Shockingly, he'd already killed her father who'd come in town for the school's graduation and to accompany her back to North Dakota. Mr. Grimsby had no remorse, no conscience. I glanced at Tennessee, sitting stiffly in a high-backed chair, her usually bright complexion now matched a bedsheet. She looked at me with pleading eyes, tears streaming down her cheeks. She'd gotten herself into this predicament had pulled me in unwittingly as well. Eager for a suitor, she'd been bold with her attentions for Mr. Grimsby, one of the more successful and wealthy businessmen in town. Not only was he rich but attractive, she thought him so, where I'd found him quite unappealing, and most importantly, a bachelor. Eager for money over love, she'd wanted to land a rich husband, but had lied to Mr. Grimsby about the wealth and station of her family from the very beginning. She wasn't a railroad heiress, as she'd said, simply a second daughter of a banker from Fargo. The guise was innocent enough, and done by many a woman throughout time to improve her lot in life. But Mr. Grimsby seemed to want Tennessee's non-existent inheritance more than the woman herself. He wasn't as rich as he seemed either. If he weren't a madman, they'd make a perfect match. But when the truth came out about Tennessee's perfidy, he'd become enraged. Her father's dead body left in the street, and the black eye on her face were indication of this, and the gun pointed at her head. I don't have money, I replied, wetting my lips. You don't have looks, but you've got money. Mr. Grimsby's eyes narrowed on my cheek with something akin to revulsion, and he shook with rage. I was used to being taunted about my scar, but I was glad he had not found any kind of attraction to me as he had Tennessee. She was beautiful poised and gentle-hearted. I know your background, your brother. You might not have cash on hand, but he has one of the largest ranches in this corner of the territory. I was surprised he wasn't forcing me to marry him instead. If he wanted money badly enough, he would overlook the scar. But no, he was too vain for the likes of me, and wanted a beautiful bride, Tennessee, not me. For once, I was happy to have been disfigured. Land and cattle, that's all he has, I replied. I can't bring you a cow. I bit my lip knowing it wasn't the right thing to say, for while he dropped the gun from Tennessee's head he closed the distance between us and grabbed my arm. I cried out at his cruel hold, flinched. I don't want a fucking cow, he hissed, spittle flying.
I want money or something to sell for money. All right, I replied. What else could I say? He'd kill Tennessee's father to punish her for her lies. What was keeping him from lifting the gun to my head and pulling the trigger? I'll, I'll bring you something to sell. He released his hold, wiped his mouth with the back of his hand with the gun. You have a week. He turned and pointed at Tennessee, who was now crying in earnest. One week and then I kill her. I nodded numbly, my heart beating frantically. I was going home anyway now with graduation behind us. I wasn't sure how I would be able to return, but I'd worry about that later. If you don't come back, my men will find you. He waved the gun in front of my face, and my eyes followed the lethal weapon. I retreated a step. He didn't do anything, so I took another tentative one, then another, afraid to turn my back on him. Tennessee was still crying. Don't leave me here, she cried, holding her hand out to me to take. It hurt to leave her behind, but if I was going to save her, I had to go. I heard the door open, and it was only then when I turned. The henchman held the door for me and escorted me out into the street, my friend's sobs following. I had to help my friend. I had to return home and find something I could bring back to appease Mr. Grimsby, something James wouldn't miss. Otherwise, she would die. And if I didn't do it in the week, he'd send someone after my brother. I'd saved him as a little girl. I couldn't let him die now. Chapter 1 Abigail I should have been watching the bride and groom as they stood before the minister, reciting their vows. Teresa was lovely in her white dress, her face radiant, with a happiness which seemed to come from within. She loved Emmett. I had no doubt. The feelings were reciprocated if the hitch in the big rancher's voice, as he said, I do, was any indication. I should have watched as they shared their first kiss as a married couple, but my eyes were on the handsome duo, Gabe and Tucker Landry. The brothers sat together across the center aisle and two rows ahead of me, with a few of the others from Bridgewater. I could see nothing lower than their broad shoulders but their hair was neatly combed, shirts crisp and freshly washed. This opportunity to look at them for such a long duration wasn't afforded to me very often, and I sighed, taking in their chiseled profiles, Tucker's clean-shaven and Gabe's with his trim beard. I'd been in Butte two years and hadn't seen them in all that time, at least until the picnic the day before. My interest in them wasn't something I could share. I'd met them when I was fourteen, and to say I had an instant crush was a gross understatement. But they were at least a decade older, and while solicitous, they'd barely glanced my way. And so I dreamed of them, watched them from afar with the young girl's eager eye. I told no one of my feelings about them. With so many nosy neighbors in this small town, I couldn't have had them discovering the truth. A fourteen-year-old girl with a crush. It would have been mortifying. But I was a girl no longer, and my interest in them had not waned in all those years. I hadn't seen them all that often, but every man I met was measured against them. There had yet to be a worthy comparison. And now, at nineteen, I thought of them in new ways. Carnal ways. Naughty ways. Unfortunately, I could do nothing about this attraction I had for them. I was not a woman to be forward like Tennessee, and I'd certainly learned from her what happened if she behaved so. I had to think of my return as temporary, because I had to worry more about saving her life than how just looking at those two men made my heart flutter and my nipples harden. But with them sitting in front of me, I took this rare chance. I didn't just look. I stared, ogled even, and dreamed. Dreamed I would some day stand with them and recite wedding vows like Teresa and Emmett. One Landry was fair, the other dark. One broad, the other slim. One mild, the other brooding. I shouldn't want two such different men, but I did. My heart wanted what my heart wanted, and that was the crux of my problem. It had been instant, the interest in them when I was younger. Every time I saw them since— it was like my heart skipped a beat. But with not having seen them for so long, the desire for them was immediate. 
intense. I'd never felt anything like it before. I could admire them, as they were no hardship on the eyes. They were more than handsome. They made my body heat all over whenever they glanced my way at the picnic the day before. Surely every woman in town felt the same way. I wanted to feel how soft Gabe's beard was beneath my fingers. I wanted to know how hard Tucker's sinewy shoulders were. I wanted to hear Gabe's deep voice whisper in my ear how he would claim me. I wanted Tucker's broad body pinning me beneath him. I shifted on the hard pew, for my body was achy with need, a need I had never had fulfilled. And yet I was willing to slake it with the Landry brothers. Late that night I thought of them unbidden. Just the night before I'd lifted up the hem of my nightdress, parted my thighs, and touched myself. I thought of their large hands and imagined it was their fingers slipping inside me, sliding over my wet folds. I'd climaxed, my body tense and awash in pleasure, as I whispered their names into the darkness. No, this was no girlhood fancy. Not any longer. As if they felt my heated gaze on them, they turned their heads and stared at me. Me? Gabe's dark eyes pinned me in place as Tucker's dropped to my mouth. It was blatant, and my heart skipped a beat. Could they see what I'd been thinking as if it were written on my face? Did they know I wanted them almost desperately? Could they sense I used them for my most illicit fantasies? When Tucker winked, I gasped, hoping the sound wasn't too loud. My fingers flew to cover my lips, just in case. James, who sat beside me, glanced my way. I offered my brother a reassuring smile, as everyone clapped for the newlyweds walking down the aisle. That might be you soon enough, James said over the noise, patting the back of my hand. For a second I thought he was referring to the Landrys, but then I remembered the truth. No, the lie. The lie I'd started at the picnic. I'd only returned from Butte the day before. James hadn't allowed me to travel alone, so I'd waited after graduation for the Smith family, a local family in town to offer me escort. I realized if instead of waiting, I'd gone by myself as I'd wanted, I would have been away from Butte and avoided the entire mess with Tennessee. I wouldn't have had to lie, wouldn't have to fear for my friend or even James. Now I had to return to Butte, with money, somehow. Besides Christmas, it was the first time back in the two years since James sent me away to school. At seventeen, I'd been a little less ladylike than he wished, considering I'd been raised on a ranch with him serving the role of parent. He'd wanted me to attract a husband, but I knew my scar would deter all men from courting me. Instead, the school had kept me hidden away from any prospect. Because of this, I frowned at James for his comment, then remembered. The lie. At the picnic, the ladies my age had gathered around the baked goods table and spoken of their new husbands or beaux. Unlike them, I lived in a sheltered existence at school, at James' insistence, and no man except the piano teacher had stepped inside the building, let alone courted me. I could not speak about a man of my own. But I needed a reason to go back to Butte so swiftly after coming home. A beau would keep my connection to the town give me a reason to eagerly return and to then save Tennessee. When the crisis was resolved, I could just state that I had ended the arrangement. No one would be the wiser, and I would never have to go back to the town again. With the ladies twittering on incessantly about how happy they were, I told the lie, a man in Butte. They looked at me first with wide surprise than happiness. I was the plain one, the one with no mother, no sisters a plain face with an unattractive scar. I wore my hair in a simple braid, wore simple clothes. I was shy. The school had taught me how to play a lovely concerto and to plan a meal for fifteen. But men? I had no idea what I was doing. I'd been on the periphery of the group until that moment, but they'd pulled me into the fold eagerly, asking after the man I'd snared. I'd assumed they would offer a passing response of that's nice, then be done. I hadn't expected them to be so pleased for me, so curious about him. It was amazing how the little fib took on a life of its own. It had worked its way across the picnic, and by the time the sun set, everyone in town, including my brother, believed I had a beau named Aaron Wakefield. My excuse to return to Butte was well established. 
It felt bittersweet to see James so happy for me, for he only wanted the best where I was concerned, specifically to see me well married. His happiness, though, was unfounded and based on a lie, and I ached to tell him the truth, that my friend was being held for ransom and I had to deliver the money. But he would hate me soon enough for stealing from him. Lying about a bow was trivial in comparison. I ached to tell him about Mr. Grimsby, but he would ride to Butte and threaten him. I'd rather have had him hate me for stealing than be shot by Mr. Grimsby. Tennessee's father had been shot in cold blood. I couldn't do anything to put James in jeopardy. Alive and angry was better than dead. I could live with that. And yet, I didn't want him to hate me either. He was my only relative. Our parents died in a fire when I was small, and where I'd gained the scar, and he'd raised me single-handedly. I hadn't said anything when he'd bought a ranch and moved us from Omaha to start over. I hadn't complained when he shipped me off to Butte for school since he was doing what he thought was best. Perhaps he was protecting me from the stares of those who were cruel, those who thought I was disfigured, ugly, like Mr. Grimsby had said. Until the Landrys inside the church, their eyes on me made me feel anything but. And as they came across the churchyard toward James and me, I wanted to tell them I was free to court free to love. I had put a man of my own making in the way, and I ached to tell them the truth. They looked so handsome I wanted to leap into Gabe's arms and kiss him as Tucker stroked my back, whispering some private carnal words in my ear. I wanted them to grab my hand and drag me down by the river and kiss me senseless. One of the Landrys would make a good husband, James commented, leaning close. Obviously, he didn't know the truth about Bridgewater where two men married one woman. But you've got your errand. My stomach dropped. Yes, I replied. If I hadn't made up a silly bow, I could tell James of my interest in both Landrys, for they would marry a woman together. Since he'd known them for years and they were friends, I had to assume he'd approve of them as suitors. As more. Still, you are quite the matchmaker, I added when he looked concerned. Clearly he'd heard the dejected tone when I mentioned Aaron. I want to see you happy, and that means married. There wasn't much else for a woman to do in these parts of the Montana Territory besides marry, have children, and he was protective of me, ever since the fire. He was a good older brother, if ludicrously overprotective, but he'd seen me hurt enough, and not just physically. You don't belong on the ranch with me and the men. Hiding. I hadn't been on the ranch for two years. I'd always felt he'd put me in the school to have me hide there, but I didn't tell him anything of the sort. What I called hiding was his overprotectiveness rearing its head. I loved my brother and liked being on the ranch. It was my home and almost all I remembered, but I agreed with him. I didn't belong there anymore, keeping house. I longed for a place of my own, children, a man with whom to share it with. As the Landry stopped before us, I realized I wanted to share that dream with not one man, but two. They tipped their hats at me before shaking James's hand. As Gabe and James spoke of a falling mare, Tucker winked at me. Again. You are friends with Teresa, then? He asked. Most people studied the scar on my right cheek, but he didn't. His pale eyes held my gaze and kept it. While his question was idle chit-chat, I was thankful for his starting the conversation. Most men avoided me altogether, perhaps afraid my old injury was contagious. Yes, I replied, so nervously my knees all but knocked. I believe you also know some of the women at Bridgewater. He cocked his head ever so slightly. With his strong jaw and full lips, it was hard to look him in the eyes as I spoke. I knew I couldn't just say yes again, as he'd think me completely addle-brained for not forming full sentences. Laurel and Olivia helped with the decorations for the picnic. Are you glad you are back with your brother? Focused on the sun picking up glints of gold in his fair hair, I almost forgot his question. I was done with school and home, except to return to save Tennessee. Once I gave Mr. Grimsby his money, I'd be gone from Butte for good. James and Gabe ended their conversation and were listening for my answer. I offered a quick peek through my lowered lashes at Gabe, whose dark gaze focused squarely on me. It took all my effort not to look at his mouth and wonder if his beard would be scratchy when, no, if he kissed me. Oh, um, I realized they were waiting for an answer. Oh, yes, I missed it here. 
And yet I heard you might return to Butte, Gabe said, his deep voice slow and steady, to marry and settle. Where had he heard that? I hadn't told anyone I would go back to Butte in the next few days, but then I considered the last of Gabe's words. Marry and settle, I repeated. I had no interest in Butte. I would go back long enough to help Tennessee, but certainly not to settle there permanently. I hope never to set foot in that town again. James laughed and held up his hand. These plans to marry the man in Butte are new. I haven't even met him yet. We all turned when we heard James's name called. Mr. Bajoran, the man whose property abutted ours in the south side, waved him over. James excused himself. I watched him walk away, and when I turned back to Gabe and Tucker, they seemed closer. Had they stepped nearer? I tipped my chin back to look up at them and realized they could see my scar straight on. With much practice, I turned my face slightly to the right to hide it. Their pale and dark eyes were so intense, I had to swallow again and glance away. Did they know I was affected by them? Could they see my nipples were hard beneath my corset? Could they discern the frantic pulse at my neck? Is there something wrong with your fiancé you are not sharing with James? Gabe asked. Fiancé? I squeaked, looking at them full on. When I first told the ladies the tale, I'd said Aaron had come calling. Nothing more. Just enough to make it seem real. But now a fiancé. I'm not... I mean, it's not true. Tucker cocked his head again. He's not your fiancé. No, all of it. But I couldn't say that. We're not engaged. Both men eyed me closely. Has he hurt you? Are you afraid of him? Gabe asked. He looked ready to go to Butte and beat Aaron's face in, if he even existed. A warm feeling washed over me at his concern. Besides James, no one had defended me before. What? No. I replied. He's perfectly fine. Tucker grunted and crossed his arms over his chest. Does your friend Teresa think her new husband is perfectly fine? No, of course not. She practically worshipped the man. It is not the same. Teresa loved Emmett, where I had made someone up. How could I have feelings for someone who didn't exist? Gabe raised one dark brow. Oh, what does your man feel for you? I felt exposed, and their questions poked, as if they were prodding at a wound with a stick. Instead of facing the truth, I used defense to deflect. I straightened my spine. Quite a personal question. Gabe leaned in slightly. A man should be desperate for his woman, mindless being with her, in her, over her. I stifled a whimper with a fake cough. Over her? Oh, dear Lord. The man's words had me all but melting. They were crude and forward, bold for one of just familiar acquaintance. And yet I wasn't offended. I was aroused. Yes, my brother is correct, Tucker added. Our woman would know, with absolute certainty, she was the center of our world, and we would make her every desire come true. Our woman. Yes, it confirmed they'd claim a woman together. Ah, how I wished it might be me. They could do it, too. I had no doubt they could fulfill my every need, even if I didn't know what they were. I just wanted to feel. Feel their hands on me, their lips. I wanted to be surrounded, overwhelmed, taken. You speak out of turn, I replied, trying to sound prim, when I was instead eager to hear more. Really? And where is Aaron? Gabe asked, looking around for the man as if he were hiding behind a tree. Has he come to visit you once since you returned? I shook my head. No, he's been busy. Besides, I have only been home since yesterday. I had five more days to return with money for Mr. Grimsby. If you were ours, we would not allow you to venture so far. We would want you near, Tucker said. Very near. My mouth fell open, but no words escaped. You learned of the Bridgewater Way from Laurel. Gabe said. It wasn't a question. I blinked. They waited. Yes, you claim a woman together. I replied, my voice soft. While those from Bridgewater didn't go around telling everyone the men shared a bride, if it was discovered they didn't lie about it. Laurel had Mason and Brody as her husbands, and I knew Olivia had three. 
The way their men looked at them had me eager for the same from husbands of my own, and ever since I was fourteen, I'd known I wanted them to be Gabe and Tucker. That's right. Tucker and I will share a bride. Think what it would be like. My eyes fell closed, then thinking of being married to Tucker and Gabe Landry. Stepbrothers, as different as their appearance. Having them come in the back door to wash up for supper, waking between them in the morning. But you are claimed by another, Tucker said, his tone disappointed. Another. Oh, yes, they were speaking of Aaron. Gabe grunted, looking left and right, then murmured. Imagine what it would be like, between us. I want to kiss you, Abigail. You only want to kiss her? Tucker asked, his eyes raking my body in a dark and carnal way. My nipples tightened beneath his blatant inspection. I didn't say where I'd kiss, he countered. Oh, dear Lord, I could only imagine where. The men put their hats back on. Too bad, precious, Tucker said. Too bad, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. We don't take what doesn't belong to us. If you're claimed by Aaron, then— he shrugged his shoulders. We'll respect the match. My exhilaration turned to dust, and I worried I would throw up. They wanted me. I wanted them. And my lie was keeping us apart. The stupid lie. Tennessee was ruining everything. Not claimed, I countered, trying to make them understand I was not spoken for. The stories being spread are highly exaggerated. Tucker didn't say anything else just winked once more and walked away. Gabe looked at me for another moment, tipped his hat then turned to follow in his brother's wake. I should have said something, admitted the truth, but they wouldn't want me then. I was a liar, like a five-year-old. Once they knew the truth, they think me childish and not worthy of their time. Even worse, once they learned that I was going to steal from my own brother, they'd hate me. I couldn't have them if I lied. Couldn't have them if I told the truth. The open field in front of the church was filled with townspeople, lingering and chatting, waiting for the small wedding reception to begin. I was surrounded, but completely alone, and it wasn't because of my stupid scar. I feared I'd be alone the rest of my life. A lie would not keep me warm in bed at night. Chapter 2 Gabe She will be ours, I said. Without question, Tucker replied. After the wedding reception, Tucker and I returned to Bridgewater. We worked for two days riding the fence lines, fixing down sections, herding stray cows, all the while stewing on the conversation with Abigail. Talk through every word she said, every tilt of her chin, the way she angled her head to hide her scar, the emotions I could see in her eyes. Who? Andrew asked carrying a stack of dirty plates in from the dining room. He was one of many men who lived at Bridgewater and shared the communal dinner with everyone who wasn't working. These days, a large group met for the meals, so the chores for it were shared and rotated. Tucker and I were on dishwashing duty, and I had my hands in a sink full of hot water as I scrubbed a pot. Abigail Carr, I replied. We're going to claim her. I pictured her in my mind. Petite. She only came up to my shoulder, with lots of dark brown hair tucked back into a neat twist. It was hard to tell how long it was, but if I pulled the pins free, I imagined it fell all the way down her back. And I would do it, too. Soon, if Tucker and I had our way. She had equally dark eyes, and a surprising spray of freckles across her pert nose. She was beautiful. She'd caught my eye the first time I saw her. It hadn't been lust as it was now. No, she just caught my heart. She'd been just a girl when we met, a shy and tentative little sister of our friend James, and a young woman when she went away to school. But after two years, she turned into a woman. We'd wanted her when she was seventeen, known she'd be ours some day since she was much too young for us at the time. But now— now it was time to make Abigail Carr ours. We were done waiting. The woman with the scar on her face? Andrew asked, placing the dirty dishes on the washboard beside me. I gave him a hard stare. 
Tucker stopped scraping plates and turned a hard eye at Andrew. Yes, she has a scar, but she also has brown hair, I clarified. She did have a scar, a mottled, puckered area of flesh on her left cheek that appeared to be from a burn. It wasn't even like a jagged slice indicating a cut. The damaged area was a mixture of her pale skin and pink scarring. It was an old wound, fully healed, yet her skin would never be blemish-free. Whatever the cause of the wound, she would carry the mark as a badge of honor for surviving. But the scar was small and inconsequential. Yes, it was noticeable. Yes, it looked bad because of the pain and discomfort it had caused. What scar didn't? I had plenty on my body, but no one judged me for them or used one as a way to describe me. Andrew's eyes widened at my sharp tone, but he took my meaning readily enough. The scar shouldn't be used to define her. It bothered me, but Tucker hated it. I was impressed he held his temper and hadn't punched Andrew in the eye. I was protective of her. But Tucker. Yes, and pretty blue eyes too, Andrew added redeeming himself. Who has pretty blue eyes besides me? Andrew's wife Anne came in from the dining room carrying a few glasses, an impish smile curling her lips. Christopher, their small son, ran in after her with a handful of napkins. Tucker squatted down and took them, flicking his nose. The boy grinned. Abigail Carr, I repeated. Yes, she's quite pretty. Shy, Anne added. I'm glad to hear she has a man. She'll have two soon enough, Tucker told her. Anne placed the glasses on the table in the middle of the room and looked at Tucker. Oh, really? She smiled broadly. He went back to wiping scraps off the plate into a pail to be taken to the barn for the pigs. The man is not her fiancé, Tucker answered, adamant. You're sure of this, how? Andrew leaned against the counter watching me scrub. I handed him the clean pot and a dish towel. If he was going to talk, he could dry as he did so. I grabbed a dirty dish and dunked it in the hot water. She told us as much. You should have seen her face. I've never seen a less enthused woman when speaking of a beau. Tucker continued. You still have stardust in your eyes when you mention me. Andrew teased Anne. I looked between the duo, envious of their obvious love. It was not a look Abigail possessed. And what has she told you of him? I asked, not ashamed of my curiosity. She pursed her lips, thought for a moment. I've only spoken with her a few times. Christopher rarely stands still at a picnic, and chasing after him often keeps me from socializing. She smiled down at her son who gave her a wicked little grin. She spoke to Laurel. Let me get her. Walking to the doorway, she called to Laurel, who joined us in the kitchen. She stepped out of the way as Christopher dashed past. We could all hear him squeal with glee and shouting, More! More! And knew his other father, Robert, was tossing him up into the air, his newfound delight. They want to know about Abigail Carr's bow. The dark-haired woman frowned, thinking, His name's Aaron, and he has fair hair and is a bookkeeper. I glanced at Tucker. She did not tell us these facts. She actually diminished the man instead of speaking highly of him. He nodded once, then continued his plate scraping. And so you want to claim her after seeing her just this past week? Andrew asked. You forget, dear husband, Anne said, walking up to Andrew and putting her hand on his chest. You offered to marry me after knowing me for ten minutes. Andrew leaned down and kissed Anne, then gave her a swat on the ass. I tried to hide my smile, but it was impossible. Their story included a transatlantic crossing, a miserable father, and a runaway. Fate had perhaps stepped in for them when Anne ducked into Robert's cabin to hide. From what they'd said, they were married the very same day. We've wanted her for a long time. Years. But she was too young. It was good she went away to school, to do whatever it is young women do. Dances and whatnot. But since she's back, unclaimed, she's ours. But she's got Aaron, Laurel countered. A bow doesn't mean she's claimed. He had his chance, but let her come home. We will not wait for another to put a ring on her finger. We were at the picnic when we first saw her after her return. 
Tucker caught a glimpse of her and grabbed my arm, angled my head in her direction, and just stared. She was with a small group of other women chatting. We were too far away to overhear the topic, but the conversation was fairly animated. Laurel had been in the mix and tried to include Abigail, but it was obvious she was reticent to join in. She was pretty as a picture in a pale blue dress that accented her lush curves, curves I hadn't remembered seeing before she left for school. Even among the other ladies, she stood out. While the others were certainly attractive, Abigail had been the only one to catch her eyes once again, to stop us in our tracks, literally, and ruin us for any other woman, forever. Mason, Laurel's husband, had once said finding a bride was like being struck by lightning, but we'd never held much credence for the concept. We'd known even when she was younger Abigail would be ours, but it was nothing like our need for her now. She'd been just a girl. Now she was a gorgeous woman. It was a perfectly sunny summer day, when the lightning hit both Tucker and me after all the waiting. Abigail, with her shy ways and soft smiles, was the one for us. The only one. But when we heard she had a man in Butte, a fiancé, we didn't approach with more than casual conversation. We didn't ask her brother for permission to court her or even offer to fetch her a drink at the reception. Nothing. If she was claimed by another, we wouldn't interfere. But she'd refuted the story that had spread through the picnic. She might have a man, but they were not engaged to be married. And by her bland response, she was not keen on him. It gave us a chance. There was no ring involved, so we'd pushed her, speaking of kissing her and what we would do if she were ours. She'd responded as we'd hoped, with eagerness, curiosity, and arousal. We wondered why you had no interest in any of the ladies in town. Now we know, Andrew commented. Marriageable women were few and far between in the area. Tucker and I weren't too concerned about this, for none of the women who were of an age to wed appealed to us. They were certainly nice and attractive enough, but none had turned our heads or tossed a lightning bolt at us. Until Abigail. I turned around and leaned against the sink, grabbed the dish towel from Andrew and wiped my hands. It's nice she speaks so readily with you. She's quite shy, Laurel added. Sent to Butte and returns after two years. People have moved on with their lives, gotten married, and had a child, like I did while she's been in school. It must be hard to return and be on the fringes of conversation. She shrugged and picked up a leftover green bean from a serving bowl and nibbled on it. It's obvious she's bothered by her appearance. It makes her not only shy but wary. What if she was made fun of at school? You've heard the talk about her, how men aren't interested in her because of her scar. We all jumped and a glass shattered against the wall. Tucker stood there, hands on hips, face red, breathing hard. I'm sick and tired of hearing about the damn scar. From the townspeople, from you, even from Abigail herself. She is more than a fucking scar. He ran a hand over the back of his neck to try and calm down. I wanted to throw my own glass at how frustrating it was to know a stupid scar to find Abigail. Not only to the people around her, but to herself. She'd even turned her face to hide it when we spoke after the wedding. It was a subtle gesture, but obvious. Tucker felt for her more deeply. He liked to defend those who were weak, who were defenseless against bullies. His anger was deeply rooted, his younger sister having been the brunt of such cruelty. She'd been born special, with wide-set eyes and a gentle nature. While her body grew, her mind had remained of a four-year-old. Tucker, being five years older, had watched out for her. But he couldn't protect her all the time, especially from his own parents. When his mother died, his father had put her in an institution, where she died only months later. Only a year later, Tucker's father had married my mother. Tucker's father had been an asshole, so it had been easy to hate him, even at the young age of eleven. Why my mother married him, I never could understand, but I'd gained a brother from it. He might be legally my stepbrother, but it was only a word. Tucker had never forgiven his father for what he'd done, and while I'd never met his sister Clara, I wholeheartedly agreed with him. Because of his history, the cruelty in his own family, he wouldn't let anyone bother Abigail if he had his way. Not even one bad word. Neither would I. But Tucker was... broken a little over it. Oh, Tucker, the scar doesn't define her. 
Laurel said, unaffected by his outburst. She went over to him and patted his arm. We all knew about what happened to his sister and why he was quick to temper. When it came to something like Abigail's scar, for something so minor with a woman we loved, we knew he'd acted so impulsively because he was too kind. He offered Laurel a smile and then went to get the broom. The other men came storming into the room to see what the noise was, if anyone was hurt. Abigail Carr seems to be under Tucker's protection, Andrew told the others. And mine, I added, crossing my arms over my chest. Andrew began to laugh then slapped me on the shoulder, grinning. They are claiming her. Looks like we're soon to have a new bride here at Bridgewater. Damn straight. Now we just had to go and get her. Tucker. Once Gabe and I were in agreement about Abigail, that she would finally be ours, I became impatient. I itched to feel how soft her hair was, to run my knuckles over her silky skin, to taste her lips, to hear her gasp when I began to unbutton her blouse, to see her face when I made her come. I needed her to be mine, to be ours. While she might have an admirer, he did not have her heart. Therefore, we had no concerns about stealing her away. If she'd been engaged, if we'd seen light and love in her eyes when we'd spoken with her at the picnic, then we would have bowed out. But that was not the case. But as Laurel had said, Abigail was shy, skittish even. While two sheltered years in school had kept the other men, almost all of them, away from her, it had not given her an innate confidence. Because of this, we had to tread carefully until we changed that. She would never feel excluded or alone at Bridgewater. She would have two men who made her the center of their world, and a group of women who would be immediate friends. If she listened to worthless people telling her she was deformed because of her scar, instead of her men telling her how beautiful and wanted she was, then she'd go over my knee. She'd learned through a good spanking she would not belittle herself ever again. Clara had never been able to understand people were being mean to her, poking fun at her expense. My younger sister's mind had never grown past one of a small child. I'd watched out for her. Anyone bothering her got a punch in the nose or worse. But I hadn't deflected all the taunts, all the teasing. I'd fought enough by the time I was ten and most people left Clara alone. She hadn't known those people were just mean, petty fuckers. Unlike Clara, Abigail knew, and yet she let those assholes make her doubt herself. Again and again, until she was afraid to look me straight on, wanting to hide the shame of her scar. They made her feel less than beautiful, less than perfect. It would be up to me and Gabe to change this. It wouldn't happen overnight, but it would happen, as soon as she was ours. Because of this, the next day we hitched our horses to the rail in front of the car ranch house and knocked on the front door, which stood wide open. Coffee and hacking preceded James as he feebly made his way to the door, looking like he'd been dragged behind a horse. If I didn't feel like hell, I'd be glad to see you, he said, stepping back and letting us enter. His hair was tousled, his clothes wrinkled, and his skin had the flushed, sweaty sheen of someone with a fever. While I didn't look too closely, I was pretty sure the buttons on his shirt were done up wrong. We're here to see Abigail, actually. We removed our hats as we passed through the doorway. We'd been in his house before, several times in fact, but never when Abigail was home. It was a large place, plenty of room for a family, if James decided to settle down. It had yet to occur, so it seemed he was in no rush. The windows were all open and I could see down the central hallway and see the back door open to the fresh air as well. Like I said, if I didn't feel like hell, I'd probably care about the reason for your visit with Abigail. Don't worry, it's just a summer cold, nothing more. He led us into the parlor, flopped down on the couch and sighed, lifting his arm to cover his eyes. I glanced at Gabe, who shrugged. We hadn't seen James sick like this before. Not much laid the man low. Abigail, she is upstairs, unpacking her bags. He said, even though James couldn't see, I frowned at him. Unpacking? I thought she'd been back for a few days. She was going to Butte, by herself, by a horse. He lifted his arm from his eyes long enough to glance up at us, as if I'd allow such a thing. Why was she going? 
I thought she was finished with school. I replied, my back straightening at the idea of Abigail traveling so far unaccompanied. I didn't doubt she would be fine in the best of conditions, but she could be in danger if everything went to shit. She's done with school. Hell, she's nineteen, well past time. No, she's going to Butte to see her man. Was it more between them than she let on? He should come to her, Gabe commented. What kind of gentleman made a woman travel so far by herself? And why would she go to Butte for a man she clearly wasn't keen on? James dropped his arm and it hung down towards the floor as if it weighed a ton. Exactly. I told her if she wants to go, I will accompany her when I don't feel like shit. I want to meet the man. I could hear footfall overhead, and we looked up at the ceiling. James sighed. She's not happy. I had to wonder if Abigail was bothered she couldn't go, or that she couldn't go alone. We will accompany her, I offered. James pushed himself up so he was sitting, although very slouched on the couch. He wiped his hair back from his face. Why the hell would you want to do that? Because we want her. Gabe put it right out there, told the only man who stood in the way of making Abigail ours. James's eyes widened, and he leaned forward, put his elbows on his knees. He might be sick, but he pulled himself together when required. He was in protective older brother thinking now. Two men wanted his sister, and he would beat the fuck out of us, even ill if he had to. You want her, he repeated, his jaw tight. Have you— Fuck, James. You know us better. Gabe groused, crossing his arms over his chest. He thought we'd made advances, touched her, fucked her. I had to stop such a concern immediately. We wouldn't touch her if she truly belonged to another— and if she was ours, not until a ring was on her finger. It didn't stop my thinking about it, but the man didn't need to know that. Good, because there's plenty of land to bury your bodies, but I don't think I could lift a shovel right now. He groaned. Just as you said, she does, though. Belong to another, I mean. He gave a roll to his wrist. Aaron's something. Gabe slowly shook his head. We don't think she loves him. James was quiet for a minute. And you think she loves you? The steely edge to his voice couldn't be missed. It was reassuring to know Abigail had someone watching out for her as cautiously as her brother. But sending her away to school, sheltering her from taunting because of her scar, had caused her even more harm. She wasn't a child, and perhaps she needed a little independence, a chance to find her own way, with us. We know she's interested, I answered, avoiding how we knew such a thing. We wouldn't tell him how she'd flushed as we spoke rather crudely, yet carnally to her at the picnic. She licked her lips, and her eyes had turned soft and eager at what we'd said we'd do. But James didn't need to know any of this, either. Is that why you're volunteering to go with her to Butte? To watch out for her because you want her? He clamped his jaw tight, and I saw a muscle tick in his neck. Then he broke out in a coughing fit. I winced and did everything in my power not to step back. Both, I replied. If she's got her mind set on going to Butte, we won't have our woman traipsing over the countryside unprotected. If the man isn't worthy of her, then we'll take care of it. If he doesn't hold her heart, then she's ours. Gabe nodded. Ours. He didn't believe in any of the ifs I just mentioned. James looked between us. I know the Bridgewater way, but does Abigail. If not, she will take some convincing. I was glad we did not have to explain the custom of two men marrying one woman, especially to the brother of the woman we wanted to wed. It went back to the men who'd started Bridgewater, a group of English and Scottish soldiers who'd been stationed in the small, Middle Eastern country of Mohairmer and adopted their custom. Ian Stewart had been framed for a ruthless crime— and they'd fled all the way around the world to the Montana Territory, a safe haven to start a new life, finding women who they could love, cherish, and protect. So far there had been nine marriages. If we had our way, and we would, there would be ten before the day was out. I gave a curt nod. She does, but she didn't learn it from us. Laurel, I think. You'll treat her right? He asked, looking between the two of us. Gabe stiffened, and I did everything in my power not to curl my hands into fists. There's a fine line, Carr, 
between protecting your sister and questioning our honor. Perhaps I did not speak clearly enough. We won't just watch out for her. We will marry her. Gabe eyed James carefully. Why did you come here? To state your interest? We've wanted her for years. I held up my hand before he overexerted himself for nothing. Don't get riled. We've done nothing untoward. Ever. We've waited until she's old enough to even speak of our interest. And it's not just interest, Carr. We're talking commitment. Marriage. We're tired of waiting. It's been less than a week since she came back, James countered. We've waited long enough and will not sit idly by while some other man claims her, I told him. Soft footfalls indicated she was coming down the stairs. We'll do this our way, Carr, I murmured, not wanting Abigail to know we'd spoken about her. With all due respect, she's a grown woman and needs to make her own decisions without her older brother. James turned his head toward the stairs, then back toward us. His jaw tightened, but he nodded. Done. While he wasn't too keen on two men marrying his sister, he had to relent. He'd known us for years, and we'd shared mutual respect. That shouldn't change now because of this. He had to use our history to let go of his parental role over his sister. What was best for her was us, and he'd come to this conclusion quickly enough. He began to cough and slid down onto his back on the couch once again. You shouldn't even be out of bed, Abigail scolded from the hallway. I've got all the windows and doors open, but you'll be getting everyone sick with— She came into the room and stopped abruptly at the sight of us. Her eyes grew large and her mouth fell open. She turned to look at her brother, but it was second nature to turn the left side of her face away from people, including the two of us. She might hide now, but not much longer. Mr. Landry— she murmured, saying the name only once, but we knew it was for both of us instead of saying it twice. What a pleasant surprise. Today she wore a simple navy skirt, the hem of which brushed the floor. Her white blouse was crisp and buttoned to just beneath her chin. It was the epitome of modest, and yet I was having the most immodest thoughts. What would she look like if her hair was down? If the top few buttons were undone to see a hint of her breasts— if she lifted the bottom of her skirt to show the turn of her ankle, then more. I know you wanted to go to Butte, Abigail, James said, breaking me from my thoughts. From the way he lay, Abigail was taller, and he looked up at her. I'm too sick to take you, but the Landrys have volunteered in my stead. She looked to both of us, clearly petrified. She wasn't scared of us, we knew that. Skittish? Certainly. For we were bold men and she had been raised quite sheltered. Her mind was working hard, trying to figure out what to say. Having us escorted to Butte was probably the last thing she imagined. Thank you for volunteering, but it is not necessary, she said finally, holding her hands in front of her waist, wringing them. We insist, Gabe replied. I'm sure your brother would like to climb back into bed and rest. If you pack your bag, again, we'll be on our way. Chapter 3 Abigail Are you all right, Abigail? Gabe asked as we rode across the open prairie. The sun was hot, and I was thankful for my straw hat. I was exhausted and nervous and completely frazzled. I hadn't been able to sleep because of worry for Tennessee. What I was going to take to Mr. Grimsby. When I did sleep, I dreamed of guns and death, and then always the decadent thoughts of the Landrys. Now they rode beside me. How could I not be nervous, spending the last hour riding beside Gabe and Tucker, the men I wanted with all my heart? Their clean scent was undeniable, and even with their large size, both sat on a horse as if born in a saddle. I couldn't help stare at their strong thighs pressed taut against their pants, their corded forearms peeking out from their rolled-up sleeves, the size of their hands. It was a torture of my own making. I wanted to tell them the truth. Not just about the imaginary Aaron, but my love for them. The words perched on the tip of my tongue. The men were quiet and prepared to listen to anything I had to say, but I couldn't do it. As soon as they found out I'd lied, they'd hate me. And I certainly couldn't tell them the real reason I lied. The idea of either of them having Mr. Grimsby's gun aimed at them made my blood run cold. 
and if they knew I had my mother's diamond brooch tucked away in my bag to give to Mr. Grimsby, they'd be livid. It was the only thing of value James wouldn't miss right away. It was small enough to hide and held high value. I was stealing from James, who was to give it to his bride on their wedding day, and using it to barter with a very bad, very dangerous man for Tennessee's safety. I glanced briefly at Gabe, so handsome with his dark hair and beard, equally dark and piercing eyes. I bit my lip, my mind, my heart in anguish. I gave him a curt nod when he glanced at me, then looked toward the snow-capped mountains in the distance. My original intention was to go to Butte on my own, overnight, give Mr. Grimsby the brooch and ensure Tennessee's release, then return home. I would tell James and the entire town I broke things off with my suitor. James would probably be happy I ended a romance with someone who lived so far away. Then I'd be free of Mr. Grimsby and then lie once and for all. There would be some pity from the townspeople, but I didn't care. As long as Tennessee was safe and Mr. Grimsby wouldn't send his henchmen after James, everything else was trivial. When James discovered the heirloom brooch missing, well, I'd worry about that another day. But my plan wasn't to be. James had forbidden me to travel on my own. Concern for my safety out in the wilds all alone, his reason. Although we'd argued while he was sick, he still won. And so I'd unpacked my bag, while fretting over a new way to return to Butte with the brooch in time to save Tennessee. An hour later, when James called me down to the parlor, I had no new plan and had been stunned to see both Landrys. When they volunteered to accompany me to Butte, there was no way out. While James was stubborn and hard-headed, the Landrys were twice as bad. They would not relent. If I declined, I would not have another way to get to the city. But now I struggled with a way to extricate myself from them long enough to meet Mr. Grimsby. And so I bit my lip once again and wrung my hands, even as I held the reins. What was I going to do? I darted a glance at Gabe and Tucker, riding easily without a care in the world. The sun glinted off their hair beneath their hats. Tucker's fair locks and Gabe's dark curls. They were watching me intently, as they had the entire journey, and I squirmed yet again. I wanted the Landrys. So, so much. It would be over soon, their kindness toward me. They'd hate me, resent me. Think of me a little girl for inventing something so silly as a non-existent bow. I'd wasted their time in escorting me. I wouldn't blame them for their disappointment and frustration. They'd easily move on and find a woman who was just right for them. One who didn't make up tales. Swallowing down a lump in my throat, I glanced away and blinked back tears. I would not cry. I couldn't. The blame was squarely and very heavily on my shoulders. I'd done this to myself. No. Tennessee had started it all, but it mattered no longer. When the men steered their horses to the west, I frowned. Where are we going? I asked. Bew is to the south. Bridgewater, Tucker replied. Bridgewater? I repeated. Why? We weren't going to Butte. It's time we had a talk, don't you think? Gabe eyed me. I gulped. What did they know? Gabe, he shook his head. Not here, precious. When we get to our house, we'll talk. I shook my head. I didn't want to get all the way to Bridgewater for them to reject me. Bridgewater? With Laurel and Olivia, all the others. I had to tell them the truth, at least about making up a bow. I didn't have to tell the reason why. I lied. The words popped out and I bit my lip, waiting. The men slowed their horses and glanced my way. Since they flanked me, I couldn't look them both in the eye at the same time, but I could feel the intensity of their eyes on me. Lied? Tucker repeated, his brow furrowed. I looked down at my hands on the reins. My knuckles had turned white as I was gripping them so hard. Yes, there is no man in Butte. You have no suitor? Gabe asked. I shook my head. No. They continued on toward Bridgewater. I didn't understand why they didn't turn around and take me home, nor ask me question after question about my ruse. I sat there confused by their quiet. Gabe only said, We'll talk at the house. Nothing more. And so the remainder of the ride to Bridgewater seemed interminable. I dreamed of them taking me home with them, but not like this. Not with so much between us and Mr. Grimsby. I'd never been to the big ranch before. 
When we rode up to a modest-sized house perched high on a bluff, I could see other buildings in the distance. I had to wonder which houses were Laurel's and Olivia's. They dismounted, then helped me down from my horse. I am weary from the journey, I told them, afraid to meet their eyes. I would like to rest before you take me back to my brother's. It was a thinly veiled excuse to keep from talking, for the ride hadn't been two hours. Fortunately, Gabe and Tucker were gentlemen enough not to argue, and, with Gabe's hand still on my elbow, they led me into their house. It was one story but quite large. The clapboards were painted a crisp white, and on the front porch there were two rocking chairs. With a view of the open ranch land and the mountains in the distance, it was a beautiful spot. But I couldn't appreciate it. Every step was miserable, having them right beside me and yet impossibly far away. I could even smell them, and their scent was dark and spicy and perfect. They escorted me down a hall to a bedroom. It was simply furnished, but the bed, the largest I'd ever seen, filled most of the space. A man's shirt hung on the peg on the wall. A pair of well-worn boots were tucked beneath the foot of the bed, and I saw shaving supplies atop a dresser. In the doorway, I took a deep breath and girded myself, turning to face them and thank them for their attentiveness. When Tucker moved around me and went into the room, I discovered they had other ideas. Gabe stepped forward, his dark eyes on mine, and I retreated. He moved closer, and I had to back up step by step, into the room until the back of my legs bumped into the bed. Gabe, what are you doing? I asked, trying to move so I didn't feel crowded. I... I wish to lie down. It was the truth, but I left off the part about wanting to do it with him, with them. Good, he replied as Tucker closed the door behind him. You may lay down over my lap. Gabe sat down on the side of the bed, and without much effort tugged me across his knees. I gasped, startled by the swiftness of his actions. My upper body was on the comfortable mattress, and I instantly pushed up onto my hands in an attempt to stand once again. Gabe. He took one of his feet and hooked it with mine, trapping my legs in place. With a hand at the small of my back holding me down, I wasn't going anywhere. I glanced up at Tucker for help, but he leaned against the wall, arms crossed, completely relaxed. What Gabe was doing didn't surprise or bother him. He wasn't offering help of any kind. I'd expected him to do so, since he was a gentleman and wouldn't let anyone manhandle me. Anyone besides Gabe, it seemed. Now then, precious, Gabe began. The palm at my back was insistent yet gentle, as it kept me still. I could feel the heat of his hand through my dress. Tell us about this lie of yours. What? Let me up. I squirmed, not eager to tell them in such a fashion. Looking them in the eye and telling them I lied was bad enough. Doing it with my bottom in the air was even worse. No more, Abigail. We're done waiting. We want the truth, and we want it now. I was equal parts angry and afraid. I couldn't get up, couldn't escape the men with any more excuses. You can tell us, or Gabe can spank you, Tucker said. His nonchalance was aggravating. Then you'll tell us with a bright pink and very sore ass. I turned my head over my shoulder to look up at Gabe. You wouldn't. Instead of responding, he grabbed the hem of my skirt and tossed it up and over my back, pushed all the material up so my drawers were exposed. I cried out his name again, squirmed. He hissed out a breath and looked at my bottom almost reverently. Then he spanked me. Once, but it was enough to have me stiffen and gasp. The pain was sharp and bright, but after a second it only stung, along with my pride. Aren't you tired of keeping it to yourself? Gabe asked, stroking his palm over the spot he spanked. The weight of it must be oppressive. I pinched my lips together. It was oppressive not to ask for their help about Tennessee, about why I was heading to Butte, but Mr. Grimsby would kill them, James too, and so I would have to cover up a lie with another. Gabe spanked me again, the crack of it resounding in the small room, then he tugged on my drawers and pulled them down so they were bunched about my thighs. I was bare to him, to both of them. What are you doing? I cried. They could see my bottom. Fuck. I heard Tucker's whisper. Such a pretty ass, precious. Even with Gabe's handprints all hot and pink. 
Gabe! I yelled again, trying to wiggle free. I'd never been exposed like this to anyone before. Not just physically, but they were trying to uncover all of my secrets, too. Knowing they could see my bare bottom, turning quite red, as Tucker said, made me blush. But the mortification of them seeing me this way was outweighed by what they do when I admitted it in more detail. I wanted to tell them I did. I ache to do so. But I knew they'd leave me once they knew the truth. While I certainly didn't want to be spanked, I did like being the center of their attention. They were focused on me. Why, I didn't know, but I liked it. As I remained silent, Gabe resumed his spanking. He didn't leave a spot of skin untouched, even the tops of my thighs. My flesh was hot and prickly and the pain of it was growing, morphing into a ball of feeling that was more than just his hand making contact with my bottom. It was knowing he was doing this to me and I couldn't relent and had tears sliding down my cheeks. Yes, let it go, precious. Tucker murmured, squatting down beside the bed so he could stroke his big hand over my hair. Give it to us to handle. He spoke as if my burden were a tangible thing I could just hand over to them. But I could do nothing but take what Gabe was doing, giving over to the spanking. I had to give up, to submit to the spanking, for I had no control. I could do nothing but give in to the feel of his palm connecting with my searing bottom. It was as if he were taking the misery of my lie and making it real, the pain of it something tangible. It wasn't trapped inside me anymore but coming out with each spank, with each falling tear. I began to sob in earnest then, letting go, just as Tucker had said. I couldn't think, couldn't worry, only felt the tingling heat spread through me. Tucker crooned to me as Gabe continued, although the spanking was softer almost as if he wanted to purge all of my tears from me. Finally, finally he stopped, his palm stroking over my heated flesh, gently caressing me, tenderly. I continued to cry, and for some reason it felt good, almost cathartic to let the tears out. I wasn't one to break down in hysterics, but perhaps that was the problem. Perhaps I needed to cry, to purge the misery inside me, and these men knew I'd needed it. They weren't running away. They stayed right with me. I let go as if falling from a high place, and I didn't break. In fact, they caught me. And yet, the truth hadn't been spoken. Only the words I lied. When they knew more, surely they'd get up and leave. But it was time. No matter what happened, it was time. Tucker tipped my chin up, wiped his warm thumb through the tears. Tell us, he asked, his voice just above a whisper. I nodded, sniffed, and looked up into his pale eyes. As I said, there's... there's no man. I tugged my chin to look away, but Tucker didn't relent on his hold. No man? he asked. His eyes raked over my tear-stained face. Seeing my scar and more. No bow. I... I made him up. I could admit this much, but nothing more. His look heated softened and he stroked my hair again. I forgot to breathe. There we go, Gabe replied, easing out of breath. It's over now. Over, yes. As I thought, they were done with me, done with a woman who would lie, and continue to do so. I began to cry then in earnest. It was over. Whatever was between us. Tucker calling me precious, the retentiveness, their talk about kissing, their ability to look past my scar, all of it. As soon as Gabe let go of me, I'd be on my own. My bottom still stung from Gabe's spanking, but that was nothing in comparison to my breaking heart. So be it. I told the truth and they didn't want me. I sniffed once, twice, got my tears under control. For a while I felt better from the release of emotions before. Now it was just wasted. I'd done this to myself. I took a deep breath and pushed up, Gabe finally letting me stand. My drawers fell to the floor. I wouldn't subject myself to having them watch me lift my skirt to tie them in place, so I kicked them away as I smoothed my hem back down. Besides the men, no one else would know my bottom was bright red. It was all a facade anyway. Anyone seeing my scar would never consider I wore no drawers. Gabe's hand was warm on my hip as he helped me settle, 
but then he dropped it to his lap. With one last glance, I offered them a small smile, then turned my back, walked to the door and opened it. Wait, Abigail, Gabe said, easily coming to stand before me, his arm reaching around me to push the door closed once again. He frowned down at me. Where are you going? A deep V formed between his dark brows, as if confused. It's over, you said. I replied. I was surprised at the strength of my voice. I'm leaving. I understand why you want to be rid of me. I'm a liar. Whoa, precious, Tucker said, coming to stand beside his brother. I didn't mean we were over, Gabe replied. Hell, we're just beginning. You think I'd toss any woman over my lap for a spanking? He shook his head. Only you. I looked between the two. I don't understand. After the wedding the other day, I told you we don't take what belongs to another, but you didn't seem to have much interest in him, and since there is no Aaron, there was no one standing in the way of us claiming you. I was surprised, vastly so. I could barely comprehend what they were saying. Aren't you mad I lied? I am mad someone who didn't even exist kept us apart, Tucker grumbled. But I lied. And still did. But if they thought my only trouble was making up a fake suitor, they would be safer. Are you trying to push us away? Gabe asked. Because it's not going to happen. I dropped my gaze to their broad chests, then lifted my chin. Of course not. But I did something shameful. Gabe grunted. Yes. And we'll get your reasons for doing so later. For now, though, we want to know how you feel about two men. Two men. I repeated. They were so big in front of me. They blocked out all the light from the room's one window. Us. We told you we're claiming you. So if you have some serious objections, tell us now. The spanking was just a start of how we're going to have our hands on you. My body warmed at his words. Hell, I didn't even get my hands on her. Tucker sounded like a child who didn't get to play with a toy. You, both of you? I asked. I knew they would claim a woman together but me. Truly. The corner of Tucker's mouth tipped up as he put his hands on my body. We need to know, precious. If you want us as much as we do you. We might have spanked you without your say, but we won't touch you unless you want us. My mouth fell open as the warm caress slid down my arm, over my hip to cut my stinging bottom. You... you want me? I couldn't think when his hands were on me. Yes, for a long time now. Tucker stepped back and put his hand over the front of his pants. I couldn't miss the thick outline of what he had beneath. I can tell you, but I'd rather show you. A wicked grin spread across his face. All you have to do is say the word. Oh! I gasped. The duo had told me some decidedly less than gentlemanly things after the wedding the other day but they hadn't been blatant. This was blatant. We want you, Abigail. Gabe touched me then, his hands replacing Tucker's, but his were a little more aggressive. They curled around my waist, his thumb stroking over the underside of my breasts. We want you for our wife. Hope flared in my chest at Gabe's words. Wife? I shook my head, though confused, putting my fingers over the puckered skin on my cheek. His touch said one thing, but my mind. How can you? I'm... I've got a... Gabe's hand stilled. If you finish that sentence about your scar, you will go back over my knees and I won't hold back. He'd held back before? I squeezed the muscles of my sore bottom at the thought. But... I tried again, but Gabe would have none of it. Is that why you invented a bow? I hadn't considered the possibility, but it was plausible. It would make sense, since I was so nervous about how they felt about my scar. I did feel uncomfortable with it, having people see it. I had been teased and taunted about it, the latest bully being Mr. Grimsby. It would make a perfect excuse, and I wouldn't have to tell Gabe or Tucker about Tennessee. So I nodded, and lied to them. Again. Do you trust us, Abigail? Gabe crossed his arms over his chest. I felt cold and lonely without his touch, without both of their hands on me. 
You just spanked me and threatened to do so again. I countered, feeling the throbbing heat of my bottom. Gabe stepped close so I backed up, right into the door. Placing his forearm beside my head, he leaned in so that his mouth brushed over my ear. His warm breath made me shiver. And you needed it, he murmured. You needed to let go of your problems. Give them to your men. My men? Yes, I needed to tell you I'd made up the bow. I readily agreed. I had. It had been tormenting me. But I didn't need to be spanked to do so. Yes, you did, Gabe countered. We gave you plenty of opportunity to share your secret. You all but pushed us into it. Had I? I hadn't asked for it, but I hadn't given them much choice with keeping them away and continuing the charade. I'd needed them to make me tell. But unfortunately, I still hadn't lanced everything which continued to fester. You told us the truth and you feel better for it, don't you? Gabe asked. I breathed in his virile scent and couldn't do anything except tilt my head as he nuzzled down the line of my neck. Did I? Did I feel better telling them the truth? That they'd given me a way to let it out? No, I didn't feel completely better because they'd only gotten part of the truth. If I told them everything, if I gave them all my troubles, would I truly feel better? Perhaps, but then I'd worry about their safety. I'd only just discovered they wanted me. I couldn't ruin that, not for anything. There was no good answer. Until I was free of Mr. Grimsby's hold, I would feel guilty and nervous. Gabe had been so insistent with the spanking, and it hadn't been from anger. He hadn't been punishing me. Well, perhaps a little bit. But it was something else entirely. Something I didn't wholly understand. With every breath, the tips of my breasts touched his chest, and I could feel my nipples turning into hard points. I nodded before I thought more of it. I did feel better. Trust us when we say we want you. You saw how hard Tucker is. Gabe tilted his hips into me, pressing his own hard length into my belly. How hard I am? It's been hard ever since I saw you at the picnic. Tucker admitted from across the room. As for me, if you don't believe our words, then how about this? Gabe took hold of my chin, and before I could even wonder what he was going to do, his mouth was on mine. He was kissing me. His lips were soft yet insistent. When I gasped at the feel of it, his tongue slid over my bottom lip then into my mouth. His beard was soft yet a little ticklish, prickly. My hands came up and gripped his shirt, holding on, for if I didn't, surely I'd float away, even though he was pressed up against me. Cupping my jaw, he angled my head to take the kiss deeper, and I melted. I gave over to the kiss, his touch, his control over it. It was my first one, and I had to wonder if I was doing it right. But from the little growl that escaped his throat, I had to assume yes. My shoulders drooped, my body all but wilted, as I let him hold me up. I had no idea how long we kissed before he lifted his head and smiled down at me. So sweet. She just gave over to you, Tucker said to his brother, his voice full of awe. Her submission is beautiful. I frowned at his statement, but my brain was too muddled to try to understand. With just a touch, I succumbed to them. But when his thumb stroked over the puckered flesh of my scar, I stiffened, every muscle in my body going taut. All pleasure, all heat from the kiss was doused, as if dumping a bucket of cold water over a bonfire. I tried to tug my face away, but Gabe's hold was sure. This scar is a problem, he said matter-of-factly, meeting my eyes. My emotions were so raw, so sensitive. Tears spilled over. Yes, it was a problem. It had been ever since the night of the fire when my parents had been killed, and I'd rescued James, who had been trapped in his room by a fallen beam. I hadn't heard Tucker move, but when Gabe stepped away, he was right there to take his place. I felt every hard inch of him, the warmth of his body seeping into me. His hand came up and his fingers stroked over the puckered flesh. It's just a mark, precious. A mark showing how brave you are. Brave? I wanted to laugh. I'd never known anyone to use brave in connection with my scar before. It's... it's ugly. 
He looked as if he were considering that as he stepped back, rolled up one of his sleeves. While the room was warm, I shivered without their body heat. See this? A jagged scar, a mixture of silvery white and pink marred flesh covered the backside of his forearm. It's from barbed wire. I could only imagine the pain he'd endured. You're lucky you didn't die from infection. Gabe grunted again. He almost did. So, am I ugly, precious? Tucker asked. What? No! I breathed. Of course not. He arched one pale brow. And why is that? Because it's just a scar. Neither man said anything. Just let my words resonate. It's just a scar. I bit my lip then sighed. Yes, it's just a scar. I agreed. But people's words still hurt. Tucker cut my jaw just as Gabe had, stroked his thumb over my cheek. His other hand roamed once again over my body, and I all but melted. How did they do that to me? True enough. We'll work on that. Later. Now I want to kiss you. His eyes held mine as if waiting for me to object. I had no intention of doing so, for I wanted his kiss too, so very much. He was nothing like Gabe. His kiss, while gentle, was much more intense, more powerful. I could feel the need in it, the power. There was no question he controlled the kiss, controlled me. His hands were bolder, curving around my body and cupping my bottom, pulling me directly against the hard, thick length of his manhood. I whimpered into the kiss and felt my core heat, get wet, become ready for them. My mind, my mouth, my body were all at Tucker's mercy. He pulled away, stepped back. His lips were shiny from the kiss, his eyes heavy-lidded, jaw tense. He was breathing as hard as I. Do you want me, precious? Do you want me to touch your bare skin? Cup your breasts? I'll bet your pussy's nice and wet for us, isn't it? I didn't hesitate to nod at his very carnal words. I wanted everything I thought about alone in my bed and then some— just their kisses felt better than anything I'd ever done with my fingers between my thighs. Tucker groaned. A shy, dirty girl. I blushed but couldn't deny it. Then we need to make you ours. We might have you in my bedroom, but we won't dishonor you by doing all the things we want. Yet. Marry us. Elation and eagerness pulsed through my veins, made me shaky. Marry you? I repeated. I all but jumped into Tucker's arms when he nodded. For once, God, just once, I did exactly as I felt instead of what was right. The men had kissed me, but I wanted to grab hold of Tucker and never let go. His arms came around me and held me to him. I could feel every hard inch of him, felt the beat of his heart. Turning my head, I looked up at him, saw the happiness in his blue eyes. Just like that? Gabe came to stand beside Tucker again. It seemed they liked to loom over me. Just like that, he repeated. Hell, woman, we've wanted you for a long time. Perhaps before it was right. But we waited. Let you go away to school. But you're back now and we're done being patient. Bridgewater men take what they want and give their women what they need. With nothing standing in our way, we are ready. The question is, do you want us? Both of us. Tucker added, stroking my hair back. What they were saying was like a dream come true. Yes, yes, I wanted them. Yes, of course I do. I, I've wanted you for such a long time, too. Both men sighed loudly, and I saw their shoulders relax. You have? Tucker asked. I hadn't even known they truly wanted me, but now it was quite clear. They were so strong, so powerful, and yet I had power over them. I forgot they, too, had weaknesses, feelings. I thought it was just a girlhood crush, but it never went away, I admitted. Even after being away at school, it came back stronger when I saw you again. We'll protect you, precious. Take care of your every need. You saw how much I want you, Tucker said. I won't do more until our ring is on your finger. Marry us. This was the second time he said it, and it still wasn't a question but a command. It didn't matter. I wanted it. Them. So, so much. I nodded. Yes. Tucker stepped back from the door, pulling me with him, allowing Gabe to open it. Tucker took my hand in his, and I was down the stairs and out into the sunshine,
before I knew what was happening, without any drawers. There was a conversation to be had about it, but I had a feeling I wouldn't get my way. Chapter 4 Gabe I hadn't thought much of Robert taking on the role of Justice of the Peace, until now. Now we rode our horses across Bridgewater so he could marry us to Abigail. Taking her to town for a church wedding wasn't going to happen. We didn't want to waste a minute before making her ours. And we certainly didn't want her changing her mind. The way she jumped into Tucker's arms led me to believe she wouldn't have second thoughts, but I wasn't going to find out. Watching Abigail react to the spanking had been incredible. I'd known she disliked it, fight and squirm to escape my falling hand, but she hadn't given us much alternative. While she'd stunned us with the truth about her man from Butte, she'd refused to divulge more, even after a stern warning. She'd needed us to spank her, to make her tell us. She wanted to submit to us, to receive a reason to finally tell the truth. And when she did, when she gave herself over to my hold, to my commands, it had been beautiful. Not for her tears, for they were hard to witness, but the release of pent-up emotions, of the burden, was incredible. She'd given the truth to us, given the weight of her lie over to us to keep, to think it had been all because of her scar. But now, now we would make her ours. Perhaps our becoming her husbands would prove to her once and for all that the mark meant nothing. We still wanted her as our bride. Andrew answered the door, and we introduced him to Abigail. A grin split his face when he learned why we were there. We followed him into the parlor where Robert, Anne, and Christopher were. Robert was sprawled on the floor beside his son, playing with a wooden train. He stood when he saw Abigail. Christopher saw Tucker and ran to him, wrapping his tiny arms around one of his legs. He picked the boy up and tossed him into the air. Once, then again. Abigail... You know Anne. However, I don't believe you've met her husbands, Andrew and Robert. I made the introductions as Tucker kept the boy busy. She nodded at the two big men, and I saw her turn her face away slightly. Her mind was distracted by the reason for our unannounced visit, so I had to assume the action was subconscious. I looked forward to breaking her of this habit. I'm so glad you are here. Anne glanced up at me, then Tucker— a broad smile on her face and took Abigail's hands in her own. These two have been very eager to have you between them. I saw Abigail flush and Tucker roll his eyes, dangling Christopher upside down by his ankles. The way we wanted her between us was between us in bed, naked, alone, with our cocks filling her pussy and ass. My cock pressed against my pants at the thought. Soon, very soon. Forgive my wife. Robert said, wrapping an arm around Anne's waist. She would like to see everyone happily wed. That's why we're here, Tucker replied, flipping the boy back up and handing him to Andrew. With his hands free, he took hold of Abigail's. It's time to make Abigail ours. Andrew slapped Tucker on the back and tousled Christopher's hair. The boy was fair like Anne, but also mischievous like all little boys, with a sly grin to prove it. You don't want to wait until dinner when everyone can witness? Robert asked. I glanced at Tucker. No, we said together. Anne tried to hide her smile, but it was impossible. We're not waiting a minute longer, I added. I tipped Abigail's chin up so I could meet her dark eyes. Robert is a justice of the peace and is going to perform the ceremony. You'll legally marry Tucker, but have no doubt, precious. You're mine as well. She gave a slight nod, then licked her lips. I stifled the groan the one small gesture brought about. Now, Robert. I all but growled, and the short version. He smiled, and it softened his features. Very well. I took Abigail's other hand, connecting the three of us. She glanced at me first, then Tucker, before looking at Robert. She was ready. No doubts. Do you, Tucker Landry, take Abigail Carr? Abigail. I was married. I was married. The entire time Robert spoke, and it wasn't long, I thought of Mr. Grimsby. It wasn't what should have filled my thoughts when I was marrying the two men of my dreams, but I couldn't help it. I had three days to go to Butte, 
give him my mother's brooch, and save Tennessee. Then and only then could I be free truly to be Tucker and Gabe's wife, to have nothing between us. But would they let me out of their sights? They were quite possessive and extremely attentive. As we returned to their house and they led me back into Gabe's bedroom, all thoughts of Mr. Grimsby faded away. I had three days, but right now, they were mine. Finally. Have you kissed a man before, precious? Tucker asked. Before earlier. I glanced up at the two handsome men and shook my head. Only, only you. Tucker replied with a manly grunt. You know we won't hurt you. Gabe asked as he stroked his big hand over my hair. I tilted my head into his touch and nodded. Are you afraid? Of what is to come? No. Tucker grinned as Gabe's eyes widened in surprise. You're not? Gabe asked. I shook my head. Why is that precious? Tucker wondered. Because... I licked my dry lips. Because I want this. You... Tucker's thumb moved to my lower lip and slid it back and forth. Have you thought about us like this? Kissing you? Touching you? I felt my cheeks heat giving away the truth. I can't lie about this, I said, although I could about other things. I don't want to do so. I think... I think my body will give me away. Gabe stepped close, slid his hand down my neck, over my shoulder, into my waist, his hand was so big his thumb brushed the underside of my breast. Yes, we can see your nipples are hard, even through your blouse. I... I can't help it. Gabe's thumb slid back and forth, higher now, curving over the full swell. When it brushed over my nipple, I gasped. More. More. Gabe repeated, the corner of his mouth tipped up. I want your hands on me. I breathed without my clothes. Yes, ma'am, Tucker said, readily undoing the buttons of my shirt. I lifted my chin so we could get to them better. As Tucker worked, I looked up at him through my lashes. Can I touch you? Precious, you never have to ask that. When I placed my hand on his chest, his fingers stilled briefly and his gaze met mine, held. His pale eyes heated before he worked the shirt off me even quicker. Beneath my fingertips, his body was so very warm and yet rock hard. It was as if he had been chiseled from a slab of marble. My arms fell to my sides as Tucker undid the few buttons on my skirt, then pushed it over my hips into the floor. I didn't even hear breathing as they looked at me in just my shift, stockings, and boots. Tucker's fingers hooked on the shift's hem, and he slid it a few inches up my thigh. Precious. I like you not wearing drawers. I didn't know what to say. If he raised his fingers a little higher, they'd see my most intimate places, and I wanted them to do so, and it was taunting. To me and probably them as well. The anticipation made my skin heat, my pulse race. Gabe took the other side of my shift and lifted it a little, their knuckles sliding over bare skin. And your corset? He asked. I don't wear one. I'm not big enough to need one. Both men did nothing, and I looked up at them, worried they would be bothered their wife chose to refrain from wearing certain undergarments. I assure you I'm always modest, I countered, hoping to alleviate any concerns they might have. With deft fingers they lifted the thin shift ever so slowly, my naked body exposed. I watched their faces. I knew they could see the dark hair at the apex of my thighs, my soft belly, my small breasts. When the time came, I raised my arms overhead, and they tossed the garments to the floor. I stood in just my boots and stockings. You won't be modest with us, Tucker countered, his gaze raking over every inch of me. My nipples furled beneath their scrutiny and from the air. I wasn't sure how it could feel so cool and yet my body was so warm. He knelt before me and lowered his eyes down my body, stopping to stare at my pussy. I knew it was called that. One of the girls from school had said her beau had used the term for the place between her legs. Tucker had said it earlier. He inhaled deeply, 
and a groan escaped him as he tugged on the laces of my boots, removing them both. My hands went to his shoulders for balance. She's wet, Tucker murmured, his eyes not on what he was doing but on my pussy. And her arousal smells so sweet. I wonder how she'll taste, Gabe replied. I looked up at him confused. Taste? I knew I was wet, but taste. When Tucker finished, he left the stockings yet didn't stand. I'll find out. Tucker kissed my thigh and slowly worked his way up to where it was coated in my arousal. His tongue flicked out. Lick some. I gasped at the carnility of it. His tongue heated my skin, leaving behind a little path of fire. Sweet, he replied, and went back to lap up more. He got close to my pussy but didn't touch me there. He grinned at me, his lips shiny. What do you need, precious? I realized my fingers were digging into his shoulders, and I was tilting my hips forward into Tucker's face. Isn't she the brazen one? Gabe asked, moving to stand behind me. His big hands came around and cut my breasts. Oh, God, I need more, please, I begged. The rough feel of Gabe's palms against my tender skin sent goosebumps racing across my skin. Yes, ma'am, Tucker said. It seemed he liked saying that when he was eager to please. The way his tongue worked my swollen flesh, he was very eager. His tongue was hot and talented, circling my little pleasure nub. It was so incredibly different than when I touched myself, for Tucker seemed to know just where to flick, just how hard to suck to have me gasp. He'd retreat, taking one fold into his mouth, then nipping on it. It was a combination of sharp little bites of pain, followed by hot flicks, hot and sharp, again and again. That was just Tucker's ministrations. Gabe played with my breasts, tested their weight, plumped the heavy flesh before working and tugging on my nipples, gently at first, adding little pinches, then harder. She likes a little pain, Gabe told Tucker, biting at my neck followed by laving it with his tongue. Yes, she just dripped all over my mouth. Have you ever come before? Gabe whispered in my ear as he licked along the dainty swirl. I licked my lips. Yes, I whispered. Tucker's mouth stilled on me. From a man? I felt his breath fan my sensitive flesh. I shook my head, leaned back against Gabe's shoulder. Tucker grunted in response and slipped a finger up and into my untried passage. I went up onto my tiptoes, which only made my nipples go taut between Gabe's fingers. You'll come for us, precious. We want to see your pleasure. After that, we'll fuck you. Tucker moved his mouth away to speak and I whimpered. He licked up my inner thigh while his finger continued to curl and slide in and out of me. The stretch and slight burn of the single digit had me wondering if I could actually take them inside me. From the thick bulge I'd seen in Tucker's pants earlier, I had to question the act. She's so tight, Tucker said. Gabe's hips pressed into my lower back, and I felt the hard outline of his cock. No, it wouldn't fit. Surely not. Please, I begged again. They would know what to do if it couldn't work. It felt too good to keep wondering. I was so close, so lost to their hands and mouth. My skin was slick with sweat. My breath escaped in little pants. I couldn't move, held in place by Gabe's hand and Tucker's finger inside me. Your clit is all hard. The hood is pulled back. He flicked his tongue over it, and I jerked in Gabe's hold. So sensitive. It's time to come, precious. Yes, please. Tucker's tongue circled my clit over and over, pushing me higher and higher. Gabe's fingers pinched my nipples, only slightly. But when Tucker sucked on my clit, his tongue working it around and around, Gabe pinched harder. I shattered, crying out, my body shaking and shifting in their hold. The pleasure was so intense. I didn't feel as if my body was mine anymore. I was floating, flying, soaring. Gabe released my nipples but continued to cut my breasts, holding them gently. Tucker lapped at my swollen flesh, but it was just as tender. 
allowing me to come down for my pleasure. Oh my, I breathed. It was never like that when I did it to myself. You made yourself calm, did you? Tucker asked, his voice deep and dark, husky. So beautiful, Gabe murmured. You come easily, so responsive, for us. Tucker sat back on his heels and used the back of his hand to wipe his mouth. Even through half-lidded eyes, I held his pale gaze, remaining quiet. Tell us, precious, you pleasure yourself? Gabe's hand slipped down my body to cut my waist. Yes. I couldn't lie. Didn't want to. Not about this. They didn't seem upset I'd done so. Didn't call me anything but brazen. I liked it, especially since they were the only two who knew such a thing about me. How? Gabe asked. One of his hands slid down over my curls and cupped my pussy. Do you touch yourself here? His other hand slid down over my bottom and lower still to that forbidden place. He tapped the untried hole once, then twice. Here. I gasped. Tucker watched me intently. His jaw tightened. I could see my arousal still shiny on his chin. Yes and no. Show us, Tucker said. Before I could reply, Gabe scooped me up into his arms and laid me down in the center of the bed. Tucker stood and gripped the iron footboard as he kept watch. With the tilt of his chin, he repeated, Show us. I glanced at them both. They were fully dressed while I was completely bare and exposed. It was a decadent, brazen feeling. They'd made me come with dexterous skill. This was what I'd thought about ever since the picnic. Had it only been a few days since my return and seeing them again, I'd wanted them to touch me the way they had to look at me as they were now. Heated gazes, tight jaws, tense muscles as if they were trying not to jump on me. Be a good girl and show us, precious, Tucker said. And what if I don't? They could see my saucy smile. Gabe pointed. Your ass will be nice and red and your bottom hole filled with a plug. Then you'll part your legs and show us how you make yourself come. He shrugged and glanced at his brother. Perhaps we should just do that now. Tucker nodded once. I agree. I sat up in surprise. What? I was just playing. Tucker moved around the bed and pushed me onto my back. I bounced off the soft blankets. Before I could do more than gasp, he gripped my hip and flopped me onto my stomach. Another set of hands lifted my waist, pulling me up onto my hands and knees. What are you? Grip the headboard, precious. Tucker kissed my shoulder as I rose up and took hold of the cold iron. Turning my head, I looked into his eyes. I saw happiness and humor there. Trust us. You're going to love this. I wasn't so sure, but they'd done nothing so far to have me doubt them. I don't want another spanking, I clarified. Tucker spanked me once and very lightly. My hips shifted, more out of surprise than pain. It hadn't hurt at all. Just set my bottom to tingling. The spots Gabe had spanked earlier were sensitive and heated quickly. It morphed and spread through my body. Tucker continued to rain down gentle spanks all over my bottom, and I found I was pushing out for more. This wasn't punishment. It didn't feel like it, especially the way he leaned in and kissed along my nape as he did so. When I turned to watch him, he lifted his head and kissed my mouth. His hands still cupping the heated flesh of my bottom. His tongue delved into my mouth and I could taste myself, sweet and musky. The kiss went on and on, Tucker's lips learning every curve, every bit of my own. It was only when I felt a second hand on my bottom that I gasped and broke the kiss. Turning my head, I saw Gabe kneeling on the other side of me, holding up a small wooden object coated in something shiny and slick. This is a plug for your ass. We're going to fuck you there. One of us in your pussy, the other in your ass. Gabe grinned. You'll love it. This plug will prepare you. Now? I started to panic at the idea of their extremely large cocks going there. I doubted they could fit in my pussy, let alone there. Don't panic. Not today. 
Not until you're ready. Gabe? I said, my voice tentative. I didn't say more, for he knew I was having doubts about it, no matter what he said. Shh. He crooned, looking down. I felt the hard object press against my bottom hole. The coldness of it had me jumping, but with each man's hand on my bottom, holding my cheeks apart, I couldn't move. Tucker turned my head and kissed me again. I was glad for the pleasant distraction. My body went soft under his skilled lips, and Gabe gently nudged my back entrance open. He took his time and was very gentle, but the feel of the narrow tip sliding into me was odd. It burned slightly, the feel of it sharp and bright and extremely sensitive. That's it, Abigail. You're being such a good girl. You're taking it so easily. I'll bet it feels strange, but so good. I moaned then against Tucker's mouth because it did feel good. Why, I had no idea. It shouldn't feel good. Gabe shouldn't be right. I shouldn't like it. But it seemed whatever these two did, I wanted it. All at once the plug settled inside me and I felt the wide base hold it in place. Gabe's hand slipped around to the front and between my thighs. So wet, he murmured, touching my pussy for the first time. Tucker lifted his head and my lips felt swollen and tingly. Touch yourself, he whispered, his eyes so close to mine. Reach down and make yourself come. I let go of the headboard with one hand and reached between my legs, Felt Gabe's fingers slick with my arousal. They moved away and I touched my hot flesh. I'd never felt it so wet, so swollen. Placing my middle fingers over the distended nub, I pressed and circled as I was accustomed. My eyes fell closed and my head tipped back. It felt the same as when I'd done it alone in my bed, but better. The feel of my fingers and the plug in my bottom made it so much more intense. Tucker's finger inside me only a short while ago made my virgin hole tighten and ache to be filled. It was as if I were being teased, especially when each man cupped a breast and played with it. It didn't take long to come, knowing they were watching. I arched my back and cried out, my inner walls clenching as I came. Panting, I let my head fall down between my arms. I heard the men stripping off their clothes but only opened my eyes when I felt their weight pressing down the bed on either side of me. I glanced at Gabe first, all tanned skin and dark hair. Lean lines led to a very big, very erect cock. Clear fluid seeped from the tip, and when he gripped the base in his hand, he used his thumb to wipe it away. We would have waited to put the plug in your ass, but you aren't a shy virgin. I gripped the headboard at his misconception. I'm... I'm untouched, I replied, desperate for them to know I was theirs in every way. Gabe grinned, stroked his free hand over my hair. Of course you are, but you are also very passionate and enjoy what we do to you. Tucker knelt up on the bed, and I looked him over next. His body was so big, so broad, just like his cock. We were worried our sexual appetites might scare you, but I think you will keep up nicely. It's time, precious. I'm going to fuck you with this plug-in. It's going to be so tight. So good. Every single nerve deep inside you is going to flare to life and make you come so hard. I let go of the headboard and turned to him. I don't think you'll fit. I admitted, worried at what they would do now. He gripped my upper arms and kissed my forehead. You're so nice and wet and soft now. Eager for our cocks. I don't think you have a maidenhead, Precious. When I slid my finger inside you, it went in nice and deep. I frowned at his words. But I'm a... Gabe pressed up behind me, his body so warm against mine. I was between them. God, the heat was incredible. We know you're a virgin. It just makes things easier for you. For all of us. There shouldn't be any pain for you the first time. Only pleasure. Tucker nodded and took my hands in his, put them back on the headboard. Gabe moved and Tucker took his place, shifting his body to be right behind me, one hand still resting atop mine, the other aligning his cock with my entrance. Nice and slow, precious. His voice was so gentle, so tender, and because of it I relaxed, the feel of his chest pressed against the length of my back, 
The soft smattering of chest hair tickled my skin as the broad crown of his cock slipped past my folds and forged inward, but only a little bit. Oh! I gasped at the feel of him parting my tender flesh, stretching me open. He was big and it was tight, but it felt so good. Pushing in a little more, he began to fill me, in and out until I was completely full. His cock did fit, perfectly too, and to the brink. They were right. There was no pain, no maidenhead. Tucker's other hand came down to rest atop mine on the headboard, and his body completely pressed into mine from knees to hips to chest. All right, precious? Tucker asked. He held himself still, waiting for me as his warm breath fanned my neck. Slowly, I relaxed all my muscles, even my inner walls, which had rippled around his cock, as if that would stop him. But I had to adjust to being filled. It was a strange sensation, but good. No, much better than good. I exhaled and relaxed, and he slipped in a bit further. Yes, I breathed, nodding my head. I'm all right. Any pain? he asked, kissing along my shoulder. He was so patient even though I knew he wanted to move. His cock had been so hard and ready for me. From the way I was stretched so full, it was even bigger now. I shook my head and for a brief moment, reality pushed through my hazy mind. But, are you... are you taking me this way because you don't want to see my face? Tucker's entire body stilled. He'd been nearly motionless before, but he wasn't even breathing now. I'm taking you this way so I can nudge the plug up into you. He bumped his hips forward and did just that. I responded with a little hiss at the dark sensation. I'm doing this so it feels like you're being fucked there, too. You'll love it when we take you together, but we won't until you're ready. Also, I'm fucking you from behind so I can touch you everywhere. He reached down between my legs and gently circled my clit. Like this. His other hand moved to cut my breast. And like this. Pinch your nipple, Gabe told his brother. She likes it. Tucker did and the slight pain somehow turned into pleasure that moved right down between my legs. I couldn't help but tighten around him. Mmm, she does. She just dripped all over me. I sighed into his hold. It hadn't been about the scar. He hadn't even considered it. Only pleasure, as they'd said. I felt surrounded, and so I succumbed with a simple, Yes. Tucker's finger slid back and forth over my clit as he pulled almost all the way out of me, then back in. He groaned and I felt the vibrations of it against my back. Just the feel of him deep inside had me on the brink of coming. They'd made me so aroused, so eager for their cocks, I wasn't going to last. Look at Gabe, precious. He's watching you take me all the way. Turning my head, I glanced at Gabe. His eyes were heavy-lidded, his lips red, his cheeks ruddy. He stroked his cock, waiting, readying. It was so carnal, so decadent. I couldn't hold back. I didn't want to. I clenched down on Tucker's cock and came, just like that. My eyes widened in surprise at the sudden burst of pleasure. Shit. She just came all over my cock. Tucker growled, his hands tightening over mine. I know. And all she did was look at me. Gabe added, his voice full of awe as he began to stroke himself a little faster. My eyes were closed as the sizzling heat had me catching my breath. Tucker had been right. Deep inside of me, everywhere his cock touched— Everywhere the plug stretched felt alive. The strokes tingled and heated and swamped me with delicious pleasure. It had been nothing like this when I touched myself. I can't hold still any longer. Tucker kissed my nape and shifted up onto his knees, his hands sliding down my body to settle on my hips. It was then he took me. Before it had all been about me adjusting to him— I was a virgin no longer, and he was going to show me exactly how this fucking thing was done. This was what I'd thought of, longed for. I never knew a woman could be taken from behind, but God, I loved it. He wasn't rough, but he wasn't gentle either, pulling almost all the way out then plunging deep, his hips bumping into my stinging bottom each time. Over and over he took me, 
until I felt his fingers tighten, his cock swell, and a deep rumbling sound escape his lips. I felt the hot wash of his seed filling me. I hadn't come again, but he kept my needs simmering. I was panting as hard as he was, loving that I'd made him that way, knowing my body was pleasing enough, that I was good enough for him to come himself. When he pulled out and moved away, I slumped down onto the bed, his hot seed trickling out of me. You're not done, precious, he murmured. Another hard body came over me and he kissed me briefly, rolled me over. With two husbands, you will be kept quite busy. I opened my eyes. It was Gabe. I couldn't help but smile up at him. He kissed me, his beard soft and a little ticklish. He tasted different. He smelled different. He felt different. I opened readily for him, shifting so he could settle atop me. The hair on his chest tickled my breasts, and as his hand cupped the back of my head, his thumb stroked over my sweaty brow before moving down over the puckered skin of my scar. He wouldn't ignore it, and he let me know that by the simple caress. He was still hard, still eager. Using his knee, he nudged mine apart, and I felt his cock at my entrance. He didn't stop kissing me as he slowly eased inside. I squirmed because of his girth. My tender tissues were stretched so wide. When I saw the dark need in his gaze, I saw tenderness as well. I felt it with the way he was fucking me, gently as if I were made of spun glass. But I wasn't going to break. Please. I shifted my hips up to meet his inward stroke. More. Pushing up onto his hands, he loomed over me. His dark eyes became almost black. There was an intensity about him now, an aroused need transforming him from tender and almost sweet to virile and potent. You want it harder? I nodded, bit my lip. He pulled out. No! I cried, gripping his shoulders and tugging him back. I'm not going anywhere, but if you want a hard fuck, I need to take out the plug. Settling back on his knees... He gently worked it from my body, and when it slipped free, I sighed. Squeezing my inner walls, I felt empty. Everywhere. Please, I whispered. I needed him back inside me, over me, just as he'd said at the picnic. He settled back into place, lowered his head, and kissed me once again. We cannot deny you anything. Today. While you may think you are in charge, do not confuse our gentleness for weakness. I didn't fully understand what he meant, but he drove into me in one long, hard stroke, and my mind went blank. Hooking his hand behind my knee, he opened me wide for him. Pulling back, he plunged deep again. I cried out at how deep he could go, amazed his oh-so-large cock fit. His ball slapped against my bottom, which was tender and sore from the earlier spanking. I was also highly sensitive from the plug. You're slick with Tucker's seed. Gabe said, his jaw clamped and sweat dripped from his brow. I'm not going to last. You're so tight, so hot. His hips began to drive into me, hard and fast. The wet slaps of it filled the room. My breast swayed, and he was slowly moving me across the bed with every thrust. Whatever spots inside me Tucker's gentle fucking had awakened were stroked by Gabe's cock and more aggressive actions. My body had no choice but to relent to his all-out assault, so hard and rough. One I'd wanted, needed. I couldn't stop the escaping cries of pleasure, nor could I avoid the orgasm tearing through me. My mouth fell open and I screamed his name. My body clenched and pulsed around Gabe's cock. Shit. She's milking the seed from me. Gabe thrust once, twice, then shouted his own release. Very deep he came, mixing his seed with Tucker's. I was done in, my body exhausted from all the pleasure my two husbands plucked from it. They'd done it so easily, too. But now I was a boneless, mindless heap. I barely knew when Gabe pulled out or when they tucked me beneath the covers. I slept then, content, sated, and blissfully sore, thrilled that being their wife was better than any one of my dreams. Chapter 5. Tucker Morning, precious. Abigail stirred on top of me. 
As she'd slept, she worked her way into my arms until her head rested in the crook of my shoulder. Her body angled against me. One of her legs was thrown over mine, and I could feel the warmth of her pussy against my thigh. I'd woken at dawn and just reveled in the soft feel of her, running my fingers through her long hair as she continued to sleep. While we'd worn her out from a very hot bout of fucking, she'd stunned us. Her degree of passion wasn't much of a surprise, but she was so very eager and open about it. She displayed no fear, no worry about the act of claiming her virginity. I was thrilled she hadn't had a maidenhead to rupture, no pain for her, only wide-eyed pleasure. We'd expected to slowly teach her about fucking, about being with two men, to take our time with her and let her accustom herself to being with us, to the things we wanted to do with her to her. But she'd wanted it all. Eagerly. Desperately. She'd doubted the spanking, but quickly learned she liked it. At least when it wasn't a punishment. And I was glad I'd shown her the difference. Even the plug in her ass. We'd expected tears and weeks of cajoling to have her accept we'd fuck her ass. But Abigail wanted it. Loved it. My cock pulsed at the memory of how tight she'd felt fucking her with a plug in her as well, and her ability to come. She was so responsive, so sensitive. Abigail stiffened for a moment, then relaxed against me. She was awake. Tucker? Not used to waking up to a man in your bed? She'd better not be. Where's Gabe? She asked, her voice rough from sleep. In the stables. He said once you're up and about to meet him there. She looked out the window. The sun is high. How long have we slept? Late, I replied, but didn't give a time. It didn't matter. I'd never slept this late in my life, nor had I woken to a woman in my bed. Besides the Bridgewater brides, no woman had ever been in our house. But Abigail was here, in my arms where she belonged. I couldn't help the male pride pumping through my veins. She was well-pleasured, and we'd worn her out. She was not accustomed to one man's attentions, let alone two, and needed her rest. Especially if we were going to take her again. The way my cock jumped at the idea, I wanted it to be now. Sore? Her fingers idly drew circles on my chest, which, for something so tame, was making me desperate to sink into her once again. Not really. I didn't think she was being completely truthful— but from the way she was sliding her leg up and down, all but humpy my thigh, she didn't seem to care. I did, though. I didn't want her hurt. She might not have had a maiden head, but her body wasn't used to taking two big cocks, and a plug. She had to be swollen and tender. Eager to come, precious? She lifted her head and rested her chin on my chest. Her face was soft with sleep and with her wild hair. She looked well fucked. Mmm, yes, please. Insatiable wench, I growled. I loved the openness of her, the truth in her eyes. She didn't hide from her desires, and I would reward her for it. Shifting, I rolled her onto her back so I leaned over her. I skimmed my hand down her belly and between her thighs. There was no hesitation or embarrassment on her part, for she opened her legs for me. Sliding one finger into her, I groaned. I can feel our seed. Do you know how hard I am because of it? She purred and arched her back at my delicate touch. I can feel it. A grin spread across her face as she stretched languidly. I slid down her body and licked over her tender flesh. Tucker? She cried. She had not been expecting that. While she was so open and eager, she was innocent still. Her skin was warm and fragrant, and I licked again. You taste different after we've been in you. Her hands moved to my hair, tugged, then pushed me against her as I found her clit, circled it with my tongue. My hard cock pressed into the bed, and I shifted my hips to get comfortable. I'd get in her after she came, but not in her sore pussy. She cried with a mixture of surprise and decadent pleasure, and I knew it would be her mouth I took next. Abigail I walked to the stable alone. Tucker had fucked me, then fed me. Well, he hadn't fucked me as they had the night before, but
but after he'd put his mouth on me and made me come, in a very carnal fashion, he'd lower me to my knees on the floor and had me put his cock in my mouth. He'd been so gentle and patient as he told me what to do. With a hand on the back of my head, he'd guided me to lick the wide head, lapping up the fluid seeping from the narrow slit. After, he had me take him as deep as I could, then pull back, over and over, until he swelled impossibly larger in my mouth and coated my tongue with his thick seed. After I swallowed all of it, he brushed his thumb over the corner of my mouth, collected a stray drop, and I licked it off. He lifted me to stand between his parted knees as he kissed me. I felt well loved, not just physically, but emotionally as well. By the smile playing across his lips, he was sated and pleased. But as I made my way across the tall grass toward the stable, I remembered once again the problem that still loomed. Mr. Grimsby. I would have to leave Gabe and Tucker to go back to Butte. I was sure they'd refuse me travel if I told them about my trip, just as James had denied my traveling alone. And if they went with me, or even in my stead, they could be hurt. I shivered, thinking about the way Mr. Grimsby waved his gun about of him shooting one of my men. Yes, they were mine, just as I was theirs. I could go alone. Mr. Grimsby didn't want me. He thought me unattractive with my scar. I'd just give him the brooch and be gone, Tennessee with me. I only had two more days to save her, so I would have to depart soon. But what would they think of me when they learned the truth? I hadn't lied about Tennessee's predicament, just never told them about it all. I would just have to hope that when I returned, they'd understand. I was helping a friend, and keeping them safe. When I went into the stables and Gabe came down the long central corridor toward me, I knew they'd hate me. I wouldn't see the pleased gleam in his eye, the dark promise of what his hands, mouth, and cock could do to me. I took a moment to ogle his broad shoulders, his narrow waist, strong muscles. I knew what he felt like, what he smelled like. How he kissed, how he fucked. It was intimate, this knowledge, and I liked the feel of it. The closeness. It was different than any other relationship I had. It was more. Well, it was love. Warming beneath his soft kiss, I swallowed down my worry about how they'd react when I went to Butte. Let the less than pleasant thoughts slide away. Sleep well? He asked. I lifted my hand and ran my fingers through his beard as I nodded. It was soft and so different than Tucker's smooth jaw. I liked their differences, one more tender, the other demanding. They were quite like salt and pepper, but they were both the men I wanted. Sore? He asked, searching my face. I couldn't help but roll my eyes, but his concern felt good. Tucker asked already. Did he? His knuckle stroked over my cheek. Mm-hmm, I replied, and I told him no. Then what? Then what? I repeated, confused. Then what did Tucker do? I flushed hotly. Then he made me come again before putting his cock in my mouth. His eyes narrowed with dark heat. Did he? He repeated. Hello there. Gabe and I turned toward the three men who'd come in with us unaware. They were as big as Gabe and Tucker, as if something about Bridgewater made men large. We've yet to meet your loss, the one in the middle said. Gabe put his arm about my waist. Reese, Simon, and Cross, this is Abigail, my wife. Aye, and Tucker's too. It was the one in the middle who spoke again, Simon. He had a Scottish accent and a quick smile. Olivia is their wife, Gabe told me. Yes. She and I met at the picnic last week. I'm sorry we did not have the opportunity to meet. I looked around. Is she with you? Cross shook his head. A quick grin crossed his face. She's sleeping off our morning attentions. I knew what that meant, for I'd had some of my own from Tucker. Yet I still flushed. If she wants a baby, then we have to keep a pussy full of our seed. Reese added. His words clipped, with a wholly British accent. I recognized the smile of a satisfied and possessive male. I'd never heard anyone speak so plainly about wanting a child and trying for one, though. Gabe looked down at me, eyebrow raised. Perhaps we made a baby last night? 
My mouth fell open at the realization it was a possibility. From what Tucker said earlier, their seed was still deep inside me. I looked at him for another moment, then turned toward the others. It's nice to meet you. I was not going to answer Gabe's question, since I considered it rhetorical. Will you join us for the noon meal? Cross asked. Based on his accent, it seemed he was the American of the trio. You didn't appear for three days after you married Olivia, Gabe countered. Do you think we'll be there? Cross grinned. Three of us, three days. You only get two. They all found the banter amusing, their laughter echoing off the stable walls, although I felt mildly embarrassed. They were taunting Gabe and Tucker in the absentia, more than me, so I didn't take it to heart. Then I need to get busy. Gabe squeezed my shoulder and glanced down at me. I think Tucker and I will have to adopt your thinking, Reese. If we want a baby, we'll have to keep Abigail's pussy filled. I gasped and whirled on my husband. Before I could utter a word, he leaned down and tossed me over his shoulder. Gabe, put me down! I pounded on his lower back. I heard the other men laugh as Gabe carried me deeper into the stable. A door kick closed before I was righted. That was embarrassing, I cried. We were in a tack room. Bits and reins and various equipment for the horses hung neatly from pegs in the walls. The scent of horse and leather filled the small space. Gabe shrugged. It is the Bridgewater way. We take care of our wives and their needs. And my need was for you to tell them we would fuck? His eyes heated. I like the way you say fuck. Gabe, I countered. Olivia wants a child, and it's her men's job to give her one. They are married, so obviously it is no secret they fuck. Just as it is no secret Tucker and I fucked you. I backed into the wall, pressed my palms against the cool wood. Yes, but it's not talked about. Gabe stepped closer. It is here. Enough about this. Do you have a needy pussy? My mouth fell open as I clenched my inner walls at the question. Even after coming just a short time ago from Tucker's mouth, I was eager again. If Tucker only licked your pussy, then he didn't fill it, he said. Is it because you're sore? I shook my head, my body heating at his carnal words. Then he must have wanted to taste you. Can't say I blame him. But my cock wants to feel you come all over it again. Think you can do that for me? Oh, yes. I definitely could. I licked my lips and nodded. He approached, put his forearm on the wall by my head. Not here, surely. We don't have a bed, I replied, looking left and right. We don't need a bed, he countered, opening his pants and pulling out his eager cock. Lifting the hem of my dress, he picked me up. Wrap your legs about my waist. Yes, that's it. Fuck, I love that you aren't wearing drawers. Tucker wouldn't let me, I grumbled. He shifted and moved, settling his cock at my entrance. It's perfect so I can do this. He pressed me down and slowly filled me. Taking a step toward the wall, he leaned me against it and took me hard, fucking me in earnest, filling me full of his seed, just as he'd promised. Chapter 6 Abigail I was wide awake, listening to their soft breathing as they lay on either side of me. I stared at the dark shadows in the bedroom ceiling. It was the middle of the night, and I should be sound asleep as they were, for they'd been very adventurous with me all evening. Gabe had wanted me to demonstrate what I'd learned from Tucker about sucking cock, on him, as I'd licked and laved his swollen, pulsing cock, tasting him as far into my throat as I could. Tucker had fucked me from behind, with a plug in my bottom. It was the first time I'd had two cocks in me at once, and I knew it wouldn't be the last. The plug was still lodged deep within me, and their seed was sticky on my thighs. Even though the men kept me so well-pleasured, I should be exhausted. I was riddled with guilt and worry. I had to tell them the truth. All of it, I had to. They needed to know about Mr. Grimsby and his threats. I didn't want them to get hurt, but I couldn't just ride off to Butte without telling them. The concern and kindness they'd shown to me was even greater than their ardor. I felt cherished as well as desired, loved as well as lusted after. 
while they hadn't said the L word. I felt it with their every touch, saw it with their penetrating gazes. It would be the ultimate slap in the face if I went to Butte without any explanation. God, they'd even think perhaps that I'd left them. The idea of hurting them made a lump form in my throat, for they'd been perfect. Not once had they commented on my scar. Well, only to tell me it didn't bother them. Then they went right on proving it to me. I owed it to them as my husband's. A wife didn't keep a secret like this. As they'd said before, I needed to give my problem to them. They were strong enough to handle it. I hadn't understood before, even a day ago, but now, now I knew. I would tell them in the morning, all of it. We'd ride to Butte together and help Tennessee, then come home, safe. I felt better with this decision. It wouldn't be easy to tell them the details, but they'd listened before as I told them I'd lied. They hadn't yelled. Yes, I'd been spanked, and it had been well-deserved, even if I grudgingly admitted it. I expected another, but knowing I didn't have the secret between us any longer would make it worth it, perhaps. This secret would tear us apart. I wouldn't let Mr. Grimsby destroy what we had, but how would I keep them safe? They told me to give my problems to them. I would, and definitely before they spanked them out of me. Resolved, I settled down between my men, my back pressed against Tucker's, my hand on Gabe's chest. Smiling to myself, I would tell them in the morning. I awoke alone, the sun streaming through the window. That the two men had climbed from bed without waking me was an indication of how late I'd been awake and thinking, worrying. But now refreshed, I was ready to tell them. I wasn't eager to do so, but I felt this was something big that kept me from giving myself to them completely. They were my husbands, and I didn't want to keep anything from them. As they'd said, it would be good to share the burden. A note was on the table beside the bed. Picking it up, I smiled at the words, the jagged handwriting. You were a good girl keeping the plug in all night. You are so responsive and eager there. Tonight, precious. Tonight we will take you together. Claim you completely. I gulped the thought of a cock deep inside my bottom. Would it be Gabe or Tucker who took me there the first time? While I was nervous, I was also excited. When they'd played with me there, I'd liked it. Loved it, even. And they ensured I came every time, so I'd only known pleasure there. But tonight... I tightened my bottom around the plug. Remove the plug. You've been a good girl keeping it inside you all night. Go to Emma's for breakfast and then find us in the stable. We are eager to have you again. I smiled at the thought of their cocks hard as they worked. Hurry. I did as they commanded, slipping the plug from me with a wince and a hiss of breath and dressed. A short time later, I followed Emma down the hall and into her kitchen. I'd yet to meet her before now, but I'd seen her from afar at the picnic. She'd met Ian and Kane and married while I was away at school. Her striking blue eyes contrasted with her dark hair. The little girl in her arms had her mother's coloring. I'm sorry we haven't been introduced before now, but I know Bridgewater men and knew you'd be sequestered for a day or two. I blushed at her words as I followed the scents of coffee and fried meat, even though breakfast had long since passed. Yes, Tucker and Gabe are eager. She laughed and turned to look at me over her shoulder. The baby shoved her fist in her mouth and drool slid down her chin. Eager? What about commanding or dominant or overbearing? Dominant, yes, I replied. They had yet to be the other two, but I imagined they would be soon enough. Oh, hello. Laurel and Olivia were also in the kitchen, sitting at the large table. They had mugs in front of them and Laurel bounced a baby on her lap who seemed to be happily gnawing on a wooden ring. Both women smiled at me. Abigail! Laurel cried. We didn't expect to see you until tomorrow. I frowned. Oh? Two men, two days, she replied. You get a two-day honeymoon. Laurel tilted her head toward Olivia. She got three. I have three husbands, Olivia countered, a smile turning up her full lips. As Abigail has probably already discovered, the men are a needy bunch and require equal attention. Equal fucking, Emma added. My mouth fell open. Oh, don't look like that, Emma scolded. 
The babies are too little to start babbling those words, and besides, it's true. Laurel laughed. By the blush on your cheeks, you know it's true, she said to me. I couldn't help but smile. Yes, it's true. Coffee? Emma handed the baby to Olivia, then turned to the stove. Please. I took a seat across from the others and squirmed a little, my bottom sore from the plug. It hadn't hurt, but I was unused to it, the stretching of it. My pussy warmed as my mind turned to my men and their ardent attentions, the promised words they left for me. Tonight. Did you get a plug yet? Emma asked. I ask because you are wriggling in the chair like a woman who's received perhaps too much attention from her husband's. You are much too bold, Laurel said, gently scolding Emma. Give her at least a week before you pull the details from her. Emma gave a casual shrug. I was mortified when they first put a plug in me. It wasn't the first night, but when we were finally here at the ranch, they only left it in a short time. A few minutes. Only... I bit my lip at the question that slipped from my mouth. Laurel's eyes grew big. You mean they put one in you for longer? I nodded. I couldn't help the way my cheeks heated. I squirmed again. Olivia reached out and patted my hand. But you enjoyed it. I nodded again. She grinned. They knew that. They know you. And when they fuck you together... She sighed. So did the other ladies. Almost dreamly. Tonight. I blurted out. I slapped my hand over my eyes. Laurel spoke up. Your men have wanted you for some time. I'm sure you've made them quite happy. If they take you together tonight, they'll know you're ready. Not just your body, but your mind. Your heart, Laurel added. I dropped my hand and glanced at Emma. She nodded her agreement. I looked down at my mug. Yes. What else could I say? For I agreed with them. So you've pined for them too? Emma asked. I nodded. I'd never laid eyes on Cain and Ian before my wedding, Emma said. I knew Cross, Simon, and Reese only a few hours. Actually, Olivia said, then paused. I knew Simon and Reese for a few hours. Cross I met just before I married. I've wanted them since I was fourteen, I admitted. These ladies were being forthright. I was well and truly married, so there was no reason not to share. And they would be. No, they were my friends. All three of them looked at me wistfully. Laurel's baby banged on the table with her little fist, and we laughed. I think they didn't like the competition, Laurel added. The man from Butte. When they heard about him, they were done waiting. They married me because of imaginary competition? I couldn't help but smile at how possessive and possibly jealous my men were. I stood then, eager to get to them. They are waiting for me in the stable. Don't you want to eat? Olivia asked. I grinned at them, realizing I didn't have to be nervous with them. They were kind and generous and open, especially about being with two men. And because of this, I said, They're waiting. Emma waggled her eyebrows. Have fun. I heard them laughing as I walked down the hall to the front door. They were laughing at me, but I didn't mind, for once. I smiled as I walked across the open field to the stables, pleased with my husbands, pleased with my new friends, pleased that I was going to tell them about Mr. Grimsby, that there would be nothing between us in our marriage, and when they claimed me together, later, when I had one man in front of me, the other behind, I'd know we were finally one. The large door to the stable stood open to the warm, fresh air, and so I walked in then paused, letting my eyes adjust to the dark interior. This is a beautiful piece of horse flesh. I do wish to purchase her. The voices came from the back of the building, and I walked in that direction. You've seemed to acquire a nice piece of flesh of your own, Landry. A very good choice for a bride. The car ranch almost rivals Bridgewater. I didn't recognize the voice carrying from the back pen, but I knew they spoke of me. Was the new voice someone else who lived here at Bridgewater? There was a large group and I had yet to meet them all. Yes, I am very pleased, Tucker replied. My heart leapt at his candid response. The stranger laughed. Getting your hands on all that land is a coup. Not many would look past your face. I'd started to walk toward them, but the last froze me in place. It also chilled my heart. 
With a body like hers, you can just cover up her face as you fuck her and think about all that land. Her brother's land is vast. Gabe. He didn't deny the man's horrible words. Didn't disagree. I stumbled back a step. Then another. They married me for my brother's ranch. They were willing to fuck me as a sacrifice until they could get their hands on it. Oh, God. I put my hand over my mouth to keep the whimper from escaping. I wanted to vomit. What had I gotten myself into? I'd been right all along. The men couldn't see past my scar. They lied. That was why Tucker had fucked me from behind the first time. He lied. Lied. I shouldn't be surprised. I'd lied to them. It was only fair they did too. Our marriage was based on lies. Built on them. Because of this, it was so unstable. I had planned to tell them about Mr. Grimsby. To get their help with the matter. Not now. I'd rather eat a bucket of nails than tell them. Now I'd go on my own. Save Tennessee, then just go. Somewhere. I couldn't go to James. He'd send me back here to my husband's. They hadn't physically hurt me. While he might beat up Tucker and Gabe for their thoughts, James would tell me they were better than other men. They'd wanted me for the family ranch, not me. Who was I kidding? What man didn't want something like the car ranch? I was just the price the Landrys had to pay— James had tried to protect me by sending me away to school, but it had only validated what I'd known all along. No one wanted me. Walking as quickly and quietly as I could, I dashed out of the stables. Once out in the fresh air, I ran. My lungs started to burn from the exertion, but I didn't care. The pain smothered the agony of my breaking heart. Chapter 7 Gabe My anger was barely leashed. My fists squeezed tight at my sides. I glared at the man who wanted to buy one of the horses. If the meeting hadn't been long-standing, we would have postponed. He and his pompous, nasty attitude were keeping us from Abigail. While well, her brother's land is vast, I repeated through a clenched jaw. We married Abigail Carr because we love her. Speaking of her in such a way is disrespectful to our bride. Kane took a step closer to Master's the bastard who didn't give a fuck about anything or anyone but a quick dollar. He'd wanted our horse to stud, but there was no fucking way we'd sell the animal to him now. The man's bushy eyebrows went up. I knew he was married, but I had to wonder about the woman who'd put up with him for years and years. He was in his fifties, and I had to only hope his wife had died in her sleep, peacefully. God surely had some mercy. Masters, you owe these men an apology, Cain said his tone sharp, and the bride. He wasn't going to stand by and let him attack any one of the women, even if only verbally and not in her presence. Once a Bridgewater bride, she was protected by all. There's no fucking way he's getting anywhere near Abigail. Tucker shook his head. He was seething. No, I don't want an apology. I want a piece of flesh. Before any of us could even blink, Tucker was across the stall and had punched Masters the crack of bone on bone loud in the small space. The man went down like a rock, landing in the fresh hay. The horse became skittish, but I didn't care if Masters was trampled. It would serve him fucking right. Tucker stood over the man, breathing hard. With a hand to his bleeding nose, Masters looked up at him. That's my wife, you asshole. Now you're going to get up and get the fuck off Bridgewater before I kill you. As James Carr said just the other day, there's plenty of land to bury your body. Tucker stepped back and Kane hoisted Masters to his feet. Gripping his arm, he dragged him out of the pen and then pushed him down the corridor. I heard Kane murmur something to Masters, but I was too angry to hear. Ian? Kane shouted. Aye. I didn't know where the Scot had been, but he joined Kane quickly. Masters needs a scorching off Bridgewater. We were left alone in the stable with only the sound of the horse breathing hard. I walked over slowly and stroked my hand down his quivering side to calm him. Feel better, Tucker? I asked, a little jealous he got to punch that asshole. He chuckled as he shook his head, hands on hips. Immensely. No wonder Abigail's been so shy. People are such... fuck. Such assholes. She's not alone anymore, I told him. He lifted his head and looked at me. No, she's not. I'll beat up the entire town if I have to. I don't doubt it. 
she's not Clara. I said his sister's name, knowing it would stir up some old anger. Our parents hadn't married yet when she'd been alive, but I knew enough about her, how Tucker felt for her. I'd known about his anger over what happened since I was twelve. His shoulder stiffened. I couldn't protect her, but I could protect Abigail. You were ten years old. You need to let it go. I'd said this to him for years and years, but it didn't make any difference. It'll never happen. My father was the cruelest of all. He waited for my mother to die, then sent her away. He gave her away. And then he'd married my mother, free of the burden of a different child. But he'd gained me in the marriage, and I'd always sided with Tucker. We'd become instant friends, allies, and his father had become my enemy, too. I hated the fucker, and neither of us was sad to hear he'd died a few years ago. Tucker turned his back on me, put his hands in the top rail of the fence surrounding the pen. Fuck, masters. No one here will see Abigail harmed. She has more than us, you know that. I assured him. She's safe, but we need to show her she's perfect just the way she is. Tucker took a deep breath and turned, leaned his hip against the fence. Yes, and we will enjoy showing her. Let's get our work done so when she comes we can pull her into the tack room. You said she liked being taken there? My cock hardened at the memory. Mm-hmm. We might have to use some of the leather straps. Perhaps she'd like to be tied down and at our mercy. Abigail. I was used to hearing taunts and jeers. I was used to being teased, hurt. I built up a wall around my heart to protect it from the cruelty to which I was accustomed. But I was surprised at how quickly Tucker and Gabe had torn that wall down, had made me think my scar meant nothing. Now, knowing how they truly felt about me hurt more than all the harsh words of the past, combined. But I knew how to rebuild the walls. I had to do it to leave Bridgewater behind. I couldn't survive with the pain in my heart, and I couldn't get away without hiding my upset. I needed a horse. I couldn't walk to Butte, but I couldn't get one from the stable. There was no way I was returning to where Gabe and Tucker were. I found Anne in the vegetable garden, pulling weeds. It was quite large, big enough to supply the ranch with food for the summer, as well as enough to can for meals throughout the long winters. She smiled at me from beneath her straw hat. What's the matter? she asked, standing and coming my way. I took a deep breath and pasted on a smile. Either she was very perceptive, or I wasn't as good at hiding my feelings as I used to be. Two days with Tucker and Gabe, and I'd lost my touch. I'm just tired. You can imagine I've been well occupied. She grinned then, and adjusted her hat. She hadn't been in the kitchen with the others to hear that conversation. Yes, I can imagine. They aren't too hard on you, are they? I know Emma's men are quite dominant, and while she finds pleasure under their stern commands, I doubt you do. Tucker and Gabe are being gentle? I should have blushed, but I was too upset. I won't be sitting comfortably, I admitted. It was a slight exaggeration, but the truth nonetheless. She didn't think the answer was abnormal. Between hers and the others, I'd gotten the impression sitting comfortably was not something the ladies of Bridgewater often felt. I'm almost finished. Would you like to walk with me back to my house? We can chat there out of the sun. I shook my head. No, thank you. I was, um, wondering, may I borrow your horse? I pointed to the animal tethered in the shade of a large cottonwood tree. I need to return to my brothers to collect a few things. Her eyebrows went up beneath her hat. Your men will let you go alone. I gave a little shrug. They are occupied in the stable with a man who seems to want to buy a horse. I will only be gone for the day. I am quite safe riding to my brothers from here. You just said you wouldn't be sitting comfortably. Why would you wish to ride a horse? I wished she wasn't so astute. I cocked my head. What they've done so far was all in practice, I admitted. I'm sure you understand. I want to go while they are busy as they have plans for me tonight. I bit my lip. I think tomorrow I will be even more indisposed. I could only imagine how my bottom would feel after Tucker and Gabe fucked it. Although my pussy hadn't been sore losing my virginity, I was definitely tender. But there, I would definitely be sore. It didn't matter now. Neither would be fucking me. In any hole. Anne looked away. Yes, I understand. I was sure she did. If Tucker and Gabe wanted to claim my bottom, 
Surely all of the other women had had the same done to them. It seemed taking their bride at the same time was the ultimate act of claiming for a Bridgewater man. Thank you, I murmured, walking toward the horse. I felt poorly deceiving her, lying to her. It seemed I was getting quite skilled at it. Anne went back to her work in the garden as I collected the horse's reins and mounted. After a quick stop at the Landry house, I would be gone. For good. Chapter 8 Tucker What the fuck do you mean you don't know where she is? James Carr shouted, almost knocking over a kitchen chair in his anger. He was much recovered from his cold, even after a day, and his fury was ruthless. And justified. He'd entrusted his sister to our care, and we'd lost her. Gabe ran a hand over the back of his neck. She left the ranch, said she was coming here, to collect her things. Well, she sure as fuck isn't here. I thought you were going with her to Butte, he countered. We took her to Bridgewater and married her, I replied. For the one usually so wild, I was quite calm, at least on the outside. Within, I wasn't angry but afraid. It was like Clara disappearing all over again. Yet James wouldn't take Abigail to an institution to hide her from the world. Oh, shit. In a way, he had. He'd sent her to school to hide her. Not because he was ashamed, but to keep her safe. And now we'd lost her. If something happened to her on the way, we would have come upon her. She knows the route, and it isn't over long. So I doubt she became lost. There was no sign of her, so I have to think she didn't intend to come this way. You've married my sister and now she's run off? What the hell did you do to her? I had no intention of telling him any of the things we'd done with her. He certainly didn't need to know she'd had no maidenhead, or at least it had been torn long before we filled her with our cocks. He didn't know we'd put a plug in her ass, that she loved to suck my cock, and Gabe's. We believe she overheard something upsetting. I replied. It was the only possibility. Knowing how sensitive she was, hearing Master speak so poorly of her would have really bothered her. Enough to write off, though? Why didn't she stay and let us comfort her? If she heard the man's words, then she knew I'd beaten him up, had tossed him off the ranch. James just stood there, hands on hips waiting, seething. When Abigail didn't come to the stables as we'd expected, we went to Emma's house for lunch, thinking she'd been waylaid by the women. But when they said she'd left to meet us, after all, we had to assume she'd heard the confrontation and begun to worry. It took two hours to learn from Anne she'd taken her horse and ridden to the car ranch. And so we'd followed her. But she was obviously not here. Well? He asked impatient. Gabe told him about the incident with Masters. James shook his head, knowing full well how much of an asshole he was. But when we mentioned how he'd spoken so poorly of Abigail, how he disrespected her, he did knock over the chair in his anger. I broke his nose and Cain escorted him off the ranch, I told him, but that didn't seem to appease him. She's dealt with that kind of talk all her life. That's why I sent her to school, hopefully to avoid it all. We think Abigail heard it and fled. Here, I added. He shook his head. If she didn't come here, then where the fuck is she? James wondered, pacing. Where would she go? Does she have close friends in town? Gabe asked. No, James replied. She's been gone too long for close bonds. She might have friends in Butte, Gabe countered. He rubbed his fingers over his beard. Wait. James turned. Why was she going to Butte? Yes, I'd forgotten her original destination had been Butte. We turned away from the town to take her to Bridgewater to marry and hadn't thought of it since. To meet her beau, James said. There was no beau. It was a lie, I told him. His eyebrows winged up just before he stalked down the hallway to his office. When we heard the tinkling of glass, we followed. He was pouring himself a drink from a decanter. No, Bo, you married her. She's gone. What the fuck is going on? We told him of her reasoning for making up a suitor. So she was heading to Butte to meet someone who doesn't actually exist? He wondered, tossing back the amber liquid. I glanced at Gabe. She made up a suitor as a reason to have to return to Butte. She told us about the man or lack thereof. She admitted to the lie, but she must have kept the real issue a secret. 
He rolled his shoulders back as he caught on to my line of thinking. She needed to go to Butte no matter what, I surmised. For some reason, important enough to lie about it. Keep it a secret from you and both of us. She was willing to go by herself, even with us, if we hadn't married her. And now she's gone on her own. This isn't good, James said, putting the empty glass down with a thud. It can't be anything good for her to be so secretive. We're going to Butte to find her. I wasn't going to argue with the man. While it was our job to protect our wife, she was still his sister. We had no idea what Abigail was involved in. Having him along could only help, unless he killed us first. He was strong enough to use a shovel now. Abigail. The same henchman who escorted me to Mr. Grimsby last week opened the door to the house. Walking up the steps to the porch was one of the hardest things I'd had to do. I knew what I would be facing, unlike last time. I couldn't even be sure Tennessee was still alive. I had no one to protect me. No one even knew where I was. I had not changed my mind about leaving Gabe and Tucker, but I wouldn't have minded them standing right behind me now. The henchman was similar in size to my two husbands, and he wouldn't seem quite so ominous if they were here. But no, I was in this alone, as I would be for the rest of my life. The man stepped back and let me enter. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath when I heard the door snick closed behind me. I was led back to the same room as the week before. Mr. Grimsby was behind his desk and stood upon my entry. Miss Carr. I wasn't going to tell him that was no longer my name, but Abigail Landry now. If he discovered I was married to Bridgewater men, he would go after their money as well. While we hadn't spoken of such things, I knew Tucker and Gabe were well off. I didn't want much. Just love. I'd traded all of their money, even Bridgewater, for the two of them to love me just as I was. I hope you have not come empty-handed. His gaze raked over me. Where is Miss Bennet? I asked. The corner of Mr. Grimsby's mouth turned up. Upstairs. I wish to see she is well before we conduct this matter. He arched a brow and smiled. You have the head of a businessman. Mr. Grimsby lazily waved his hand at his henchman, and he disappeared down the hall. I am here for Miss Bennet. If she is... dead. I swallowed at the possibility of her demise. As is her father. Then there was no need to bargain with you. He rose from his chair, buttoned his suit jacket. That is where you are wrong. Your friend has no impact on your livelihood. Only after your delivery of money will you be set free. While I wished to step back, even turn and bolt down the hall and out the front door, I refused to cow to this man. That was not the arrangement. I countered. Footsteps came down the stairs. Your job was to bring me money. Did you think I would allow you to fail? Tennessee came into the room then. While she was well-dressed and seemed completely unharmed, dark circles marred her pretty face. Frown lines formed at the corners of her mouth. Even so, I was thrilled to see her— Alive. Abigail! She cried, running into my arms. She shook like a leaf as I hugged her to me. Please say you've brought what he wants, she whispered. She stepped back and eyed me with a dangerous level of hope. I opened the ridicule dangling from my wrist and pulled out my mother's brooch. Stepping forward, I placed it on the desk where Mr. Grimsby greedily picked it up. Taking a moment, he studied it. Very nice. I sighed, relieved. Come, Tennessee. Let us leave. With my chin high, I held out my hand for my friend to take. I turned toward the door. Very nice, Mr. Grimsby repeated, but not enough. My stomach plummeted, and Tennessee gripped my hand like a vice. Slowly, I turned to face Mr. Grimsby. This brooch is worth a hundred dollars, not much more. I need more, he shouted, spittle flying from his mouth. Why? I asked, looking around the opulent room. You have a beautiful house, clothing, a mine. The mine has run dry. So I am to personally pay for your lavish lifestyle in exchange for my health. He grinned. Exactly. Marry some rich heiress. While Miss Bennet deceived you, there are other women here in Butte with more money than God. It's the richest town on earth. The mines surrounding the city were heavily laden with copper. So much so, there was more money here than in New York or anywhere else. If he wanted to land a rich bride, he was in the right place. 
It's not as easy as it seems, he replied. I sniffed. Perhaps if you weren't such a brute, women might actually find you charming. He didn't seem bothered by my sharp retort. Perhaps I will marry you. I can tolerate your damaged face in exchange for your money. It was then I realized I'd taken the wrong tack. Tennessee painfully gripped my hand. I wasn't sure if it was out of fear or because she wanted me to stop talking. There was no good conclusion to this confrontation. Not for me, at least. Let Miss Bennett go. She's just a pawn. You want money from me. She is not the collateral you need. I tilted my head and whispered to my friend. Go. Start walking and don't come back. Her sweaty hold disappeared and she slowly walked away. Mr. Grimsby didn't stop her, nor did his henchmen. They knew my statement was correct. She had no value to him. I heard her quick steps as she neared the door, then opened it and slammed shut in her haste to get away. Now then, I believe marrying you is a good idea after all. Mr. Grimsby looked over my shoulder toward the henchman. Go collect a priest. Any one will do. A priest? I wasn't marrying him. Not only was I already married, but I felt sick of the idea of being his wife. What I had shared with Tucker and Gabe had been special. I couldn't imagine doing those things with Mr. Grimsby. The idea of seeing him naked, forcing me to my knees to take his cock in my mouth made me gag. When I heard the door close once again, I pulled the gun from my ridicule. There was no way I was going to let him proceed. While my hand was steady as I aimed at him, my nerves were frayed. I'd found the weapon in the Landry's kitchen. I didn't know which brother it belonged to, but it was loaded and hopefully enough to deter Mr. Grimsby, at least enough to escape his house. I'll be leaving now, and you will leave me alone. The brooch will be all the payment you receive from me. I retreated, only glancing to the side so I didn't bump into anything. Mr. Grimsby stepped toward me, eyes narrowed and angry. As he lunged toward me, I fired, shooting just over his right shoulder. That was a warning. He put his hands up and stayed still, clearly surprised I wasn't afraid to use the gun. I heard the front door open, but I was afraid to look behind me, to take my eyes off the man who could surely disarm me. But I couldn't give the henchman behind me the chance to grab the weapon, so I spun on my heels and ran for the door toward my only escape. I didn't even make it a step before I bumped into a hard body, strong hands gripping my arms, holding me still. I struggled and shouted, fought him, but it was no use. I couldn't defend myself against someone so powerful. No! I had lost. Chapter 9 Tucker Seeing Abigail with a smoking gun back away from the bastard, one I instantly recognized as my own. In her hands had my anger grow, to the point where I could barely see straight. Gabe and James were right behind me, but I couldn't do anything but grab hold of Abigail. I usually went after the danger and eliminated it, but not this time. Yes, I wanted to take the weapon out of her hand and just shoot the bastard, but I needed to ensure her safety. Gabe could have his turn with vengeance. But instead of wrapping her arms about me and holding on for dear life, Abigail fought me pummeling my chest with her hands, pushing and struggling to get away. When she waved the gun in my face as she fought, I realized she didn't know who I was. She thought I was the man who'd walked out of the house as we were going up the walk. While he was big, he wasn't any match for the three of us. My heart ached knowing she was fighting for her life, that she thought a man was holding her to hurt her. Her strength and energy was impressive, but it only showed her desperation. What had this man done? She appeared unharmed, but I knew damage could be inflicted in ways not discernible. If she had been harmed, then I'd fucking shoot the man, even if he was already dead. When the hard metal hit my chin, I took hold of her wrist, forcing the gun to point away from both of us. Christ, she was going to shoot one of us by accident in her haze of fear. Abigail! I bit her name out in a harsh growl. Enough! No, leave me alone! She continued to fight, but I would not relent on my hold. I never would again. It's Tucker, stop. All at once her fighting ceased. I stripped the gun from her, tossed it behind me without even looking, knowing James was there to catch it, then cupped her face in my hands. Look at me. Her eyes met mine, wild and searching. 
It took her a few seconds to focus on me, for her racing mind to catch up to what was before her. That's it, precious. You're safe now. I saw the moment she saw me. Tucker? Oh, God, Tucker! She sighed, wrapping her arms about me in a hug so tight I let out an oomph. Pressing her face against my chest, I lowered my head and just breathed her in. I nuzzled the top of her head. Her hair tickled my mouth as I kissed it. Gabe and the man were arguing. James stalked past me and into the office. I could see them, but I ignored it all. All but Abigail. I sighed, letting all the anger, all the fear, everything seep out of me as I held her close. She was warm, and although she still shook with excess energy, she was alive. Come, I said putting my arm about her waist and leading her out into the sunshine. When she didn't resist me, she spoke up. But Gabe and your brother will take care of him. I didn't offer more. Didn't offer that they'd probably kill him for whatever the fuck it was he did to her. While we'd been able to track her to the man's house, we didn't know why she was there exactly. We stood out on the sidewalk as the Butte police came in, guided by a hysterical woman who pointed to the open front door. I didn't let Abigail go, didn't speak, just held her as the world went by around us. Time stood still. Nothing mattered but that I'd gotten to her, had saved her. Gabe came toward us, eventually, every line of his body rigid. When he stood directly before me, he nodded once, indicating the problem was resolved. How I didn't ask, I didn't care. But I knew my brother had ensured Abigail's safety. Go to Gabe, precious. He needs you. I turned her around and she stepped into Gabe's arms. She cried then, sobbing on the sidewalk as my brother held her. Wiping a hand over my face, I exhaled. James, escorting the haired woman who'd brought the police, joined us. Abigail, the woman pleaded, dashing over and taking her hand. She was even smaller than our wife, with pale hair and large blue eyes. If she wasn't so pale and gaunt, she would be considered beautiful. I'm so sorry. She squeezed Abigail's hand. I didn't mean to pull you into this, to put you in danger with Mr. Grimsby. It was just a simple lie. I frowned. She'd caused all this? Caused Abigail to be afraid of the bastard enough to wave a gun? Shoot it, even, to defend herself? I wanted to know why she was even in that house, but it would have to wait. It seems there's a fair amount of lying these days, Gabe admonished. Both women's cheeks turned pink. Where will you go, Tennessee? Abigail murmured. She stepped back from Gabe, but he kept one arm about her waist. Tennessee? Was that her name or her destination? The woman looked at the ground. I... I don't know. But you've done enough for me. Lifting her head, she offered Abigail a brittle smile. I'll be fine. And I will avoid dangerous men, I promise. I have learned my lesson. Good, James said because you're coming home with me. The woman's mouth fell open as she slowly shook her head. I can't. I don't even know you. Abigail, James said. Abigail sniffed then, lifted her hand. Miss Tennessee Bennett, this is my brother, James Carr. James rolled his shoulders back. With the introductions out of the way, he said, Miss Bennett, you have no place to go, no family. She shook her head. Money? She looked away, not responding. How will you live? Go to the Briar Rose and earn your keep on your back? Miss Bennett blanched, swallowed. If, if I must? I couldn't miss hearing the growl rumbling from James's chest. You will be coming home with me, he repeated. Good, because neither Gabe nor I would let her seek employment at a brothel. Miss Bennett couldn't argue with James on this. If she truly was destitute, she had no other option. Before the woman could argue further, Gabe said, We're going home. At his words, Abigail flinched. Then she stepped away from Gabe's arm as if it were a serpent about her waist. She shook her head. No, I'm not going with you. Yes, you are, Gabe bit out. I came to save my wife from a madman and take her home. Wife? Abigail laughed then sniffed. It'll be much easier for you not to look at me when I'm not around. Bitterness and anger laced every word. Look at you. Gabe countered. 
We're probably the first people who've actually seen you, Abigail. What the hell is she talking about? James asked. I'd never seen Abigail so upset. This wasn't a crying jag to bleed off the excess energy from her brush with danger. This was all-out anger. This was something different. Like most women, and perhaps all who'd graduated from a fancy finishing school, she had been taught to hide her emotions. But she must have failed deportment, because she was letting her ire show. At us. Abigail was furious with me and Gabe. Let's get off the street and talk about this. At home. I said. She took a step back when I moved toward her to take her arm. And you call me a liar, she hissed. You took me from behind so you couldn't see my face. It's just as I thought and you lied. Before I could lift my hands, James had closed the distance between us and punched me in the face. Shit, I muttered, covering my jaw with my fingers. I wiped blood from the corner of my mouth. The man could hit. You said you waited for her had wanted her for years. This is how you treat her? How you, you claim her? It was a good thing we were on a quiet residential street, for we would have drawn quite the crowd. It was also good the police were still inside the house. Someone was going to end up in jail if we kept this up. Abigail spun on her brother, pointing her finger in his chest. You didn't want me either. What? He shouted, looking angry and surprised at the same time. What are you talking about? You put me in school because of my scar. Hid me away so people couldn't see me. I know what people say. Even Mr. Grimsby thought I was hideous. If this Grimsby was the asshole inside, then thank fuck for that, I thought. Then wanted to stomp right into the bastard's house and beat the shit out of him. But you! She poked James again. You're the worst. You're my brother, and you— And you— Tears streamed down her face, and she swallowed hard trying to talk past her fears. Set me off so you didn't have to see me anymore. It was all so similar to what my father had done with Clara. While she'd been so sweet and innocent, happy and so fucking cheerful all the time, she drew attention. Some people were good to her, but others. Others were cruel. My father had been tired of hearing how defective she was and that she should be institutionalized. He'd held off until my mother died. His daughter wasn't perfect, wasn't normal so he got rid of her. Tossed her out like rubbish. That's what Abigail thought James had done with her, but I knew him. Knew him well enough to understand it was exactly the opposite. He wasn't like my father. While protecting her, he'd given her every possible advantage. James literally wilted before my eyes. That's what you think? I was ashamed of you? Abigail looked away. We aren't avoiding this, Abigail Jane. You actually think I sent you to school because I didn't want to see the scar on your face. She looked at the ground but nodded once. James exhaled, ran a hand over his face. I sent you to school because I love you. You deserve the best. How better than the best. Every time I see that scar, I think of what you sacrificed. For me. It is my fault you have it and I have to live with the weight, the guilt every day. You sent me away so you don't have to, right? James gripped Abigail's shoulders and all but shook her. No, you fool. I sent you away because you should be smart and poised and fucking happy. I had the means to put you in school and I gave it to you. I'd give you the moon if I could grab it. Even if I could, it wouldn't compare to what you've given me. Her mouth fell open. So I should have left you to die in the fire? She'd been injured because of the fire that killed her parents and saving James from it? James closed his eyes. Of course not. But you paid a terrible price. He stroked his fingers over her scar. I saved you, my brother. I couldn't live without you. I'd say it was worth it, she whispered. It was true. Abigail had bravely saved her brother from a fire, from death, and she'd paid the price by being burned. James pulled her into his arms for a hug so fierce, so personal, it was hard to watch. No wonder he was protective and careful with her. The guilt he felt must be intense. Abigail had a brother who loved her, perhaps too much. But that was never a bad thing. I'd had a sister who my father didn't love enough. And that was the difference. Love. It wasn't that Clara was different. Wasn't like everyone else. 
It was because my father had been a cruel fucker who cared only about himself. James pushed her back. You're caught up on your scar. You need to let it go. So do you, then, she countered. James nodded. All right. We'll both try. He turned his head to look at me and Gabe. As for your husband's... He let the rest of the words go unsaid. The sharp pain in my jaw filled the blanks. The sheriff came out then, joining us on the sidewalk. He hoisted up his pants and wiped his sweaty brow. Mind telling us what's going on? James asked the man. I was eager to hear it as well. Seems Grimsby's mind has run dry. He's destitute, but you wouldn't know it by looking at him. The sheriff glanced over his shoulder at the brick mansion. Through marrying Miss Bennett here, he planned to get hold of enough money to regain his social standing. All eyes turned to Abigail's friend. She blushed, and based on what she said to Abigail, she lied about having money. How many lies were there? Surely people knew the mine wasn't putting out, Gabe said. The sheriff nodded. They did, but the only place aware of his financial fallout was the bank. So when Miss Bennett turned out to be... Begging your pardon, ma'am, less than he desired. The sheriff removed his hat and nodded at her. He sought other sources of income. Blackmail, James asked. That and kidnapping. There are a few other crimes unrelated to the ladies here, but he won't be bothering anyone for a long time. You're free to go. A deputy called him back inside. He nodded to us, then turned back to the house, putting his hat on as he went. You were being blackmailed and didn't tell us. I was equal parts stunned and furious with Abigail. We're your husbands. Miss Bennett gasped and whispered. Husbands? I think there are a number of misunderstandings today, Carr. Gabe said to James. Well, you might be her brother, we're her husbands, and we're taking her home. If you want to punch me first, get it over with. James looked down at Abigail, then turned her toward us. Well, I want to put you in your room for the next two weeks, Abigail. You belong to your husbands now. Go with them. What? She spluttered. Didn't you hear what I said? They don't want me. They don't even want to look at me. James eyed us closely, somehow deciding whether we were worthy of his sister. You need to talk with your men. I won't let you live under false notions any longer. I trust them, and so should you. I was relieved he respected our role as her husbands and trusted we'd take care of her. There were lies and fucking blackmail to talk through. There would be punishment for our new bride. Take my sister home. Ensure something like this will never happen again. He meant punish her, which I was all too eager to do. James! Abigail cried, astonished, crossing her arms over her chest. They don't want me. Bring her to the ranch next week for dinner. The way he ignored Abigail's spluttering meant he believed whatever was going on between us was resolvable, and perhaps grounded in the issue with her scar. If they could talk through it, then so could we. Gabe nodded, shook James's hand. After stepping close and kissing Abigail's forehead, James turned to Miss Bennett holding out his elbow. Ma'am, you'll come with me, but we will be talking about your role in all of this. Don't think because you're safe you won't face the consequences of your actions. The woman eyed him with trepidation. I believe I've learned what the consequences are. James shook his head at her. Not all of them. He waited patiently for her to take his arm. While he seemed gentlemanly in the gesture, I knew if she refused he'd probably toss her over his shoulder. But she took the proffered arm and went with James down the street. When Abigail finally looked at me with those beautiful dark eyes, I shook my head slowly. Not one word, precious. Not here. We're going home, and you can tell us about it when you're over my lap, ass bare and red from my hand. She spluttered with indignation all the way home. Chapter 10 Abigail Riding in Gabe's lap the entire way back to Bridgewater had been wonderful and horrible. After the encounter with Mr. Grimsby, I needed to feel Tucker's arms around me, then Gabe's with a fierce desperation. Then I'd remembered— remembered the conversation they'd had in the stable. I ached for them, to have it once again to be so perfect with them. But it had all been a lie, and so I rode in silence, feeling every inch of Gabe's hard body against mine, my heart breaking. If you can't stand to look at me, why did you marry me? 
I asked Gabe once he lowered me to the ground from his horse. I refused to go inside the house with them without knowing. I wished my voice was stronger, that I was stronger, but the tears fell. Gabe dismounted, tied the horse's lead and leaned against the rail. Tucker sat down on the steps leading up to the porch and put his elbows on his thighs. He tipped his hat back so he could meet my watery gaze. What has you thinking this? Gabe asked. The sable, the man. He said mean things about me and you didn't deny them. You lied to me. With trembling fingers I wiped the tears from my cheeks. Seems like there's a whole slew of lies these days, Tucker countered. Let's work through them. I kicked a clot of dirt in the short grass in front of the house. The sun was low enough in the sky to be blocked by the building. Mr. Masters did speak disrespectfully, and I'm sorry you heard that. What you obviously didn't hear was when we told him we married you because we were in love. I gasped at Tucker's plain words, then dropped to the ground since my legs couldn't hold me. The words had literally knocked me off my feet. My dress billowed around me in the grass. Love. You obviously didn't hear the man's nose breaking. And you didn't see Cain and Ian dragging the bastard to the property line. Gabe added. My mouth fell open. Did you? Tucker asked. I gave a little shake of my head as I glanced up at him through my tear-fringed lashes. I heard them mean words, then ran out. We haven't lied to you, precious. Not once. As for fucking you the first time, Tucker told you why he took you that way. Because he wanted you to feel good. I nodded numbly again, remembering he'd done just that. I'm not keeping track, but if I'm correct, every other time we fucked you, we've been face to face and watched you as you came. Gabe added. My tears fell even harder now, knowing I'd done both of them a disservice, especially in using it as a weapon against them with my brother. I am sorry, Tucker began. So very sorry you had to hear what Master said at all. I should have punched him in the face sooner. Gabe made a sound of agreement. Perhaps you should start from the beginning about your lies. I flinched but knew the words were warranted. I wiped my cheeks, sniffed once then again, and told him the entire sordid story from the beginning. I spoke of my friendship with Tennessee, her interest in Mr. Grimsby, her pretense of being wealthy, then in Mr. Grimsby and his threats, and on and on. Neither man interrupted me and as I spoke the words came easily. I told them of the made-up bow, but it was only part of the big lie. When the recounting finished, I was truly lie-free. You did all that to save your friend? Gabe asked. I'd been looking down at my fingers, clutched together, but I met Gabe's dark eyes at his question. Of course. I couldn't just leave her to that man. No. You like to rescue everyone, Tucker replied, not caring about the expense to you. He met my brother and how I'd saved him from the fire. My scar. He did have a gun. I said, grumbling, thinking of Mr. Grimsby. It hadn't been the right thing to say. Tucker's jaw ticked. A gun? It is not your job to save your friend. Alone. He added. Why didn't you tell us? Gabe wondered. Why didn't I? Because Mr. Grimsby would have killed you. You don't think we can protect ourselves and you, precious? Tucker asked. I, I just didn't want you hurt. The thought of that happening made my stomach churn. He pierced me with his light eyes. A slight breeze lifted the hair from his forehead. He was so handsome, so intensely perfect. And why is that? Because, because I love you too. I always have. Tucker stood to his full height and walked over to me. I had to tilt my chin back to look up at him. He was so tall, so foreboding I had to wonder why I'd ever questioned their abilities. He scooped me up by my upper arms, hauled me against him, and kissed me. My feet were off the ground, dangling, but I didn't care. Tucker's mouth was on mine, hot and eager, searching, and... God, perfect. Wrapping my arms about his neck, I held on, afraid to ever let go. He pulled back, then set me back down on my feet, but he tugged me with him so he was sitting once again on the step this time with me on his lap. Do you know why I'm so protective of you, precious? I shrugged against his shirt. You did say you loved me. That, yes. Tucker grunted and kissed the top of my head. 
It's time I told you a story of my own, about a girl named Clara. My sister long before my father married Gabe's mother, before I knew him at all. Sometime while Tucker was telling me about his sister, Gabe sat beside us, looked out at the prairie, the buildings in the distance, at Bridgewater. Tucker had me crying once again before he was done. The poor girl without any understanding of people being so mean. No wonder he was so ruthlessly protective. Can you see why I was speaking the truth? We, brother, Gabe added. Why we were speaking the truth when we said we don't see the scar. We love you. We have for years. Gabe laughed. Probably for too long. Then you're not mad? I asked. Gabe tucked my hair back behind my ear. Mad? At you? I nodded, bit my lip. Furious for putting yourself in danger, he replied. Disappointed you didn't believe in us enough to know we wouldn't go along with masters. Tucker added. Upset you didn't tell us the truth. I rate you went off on your own. The list was long and they added to it, back and forth. But we love you, Gabe repeated. I relaxed and exhaled a pent-up breath at the last. To hear those words from him, from them, was like a balm to a festering wound. It healed me in ways I never ever imagined. Tucker stood up easily, holding me in his arms as he did so. He turned and strode up the steps and into the house. But that does not mean you won't be punished. Gabe Tucker carried Abigail up the stairs and into his bedroom. I followed but at a slight distance, afraid I might get kicked with all the wiggling and thrashing about she was doing. Put me down, she cried. Gladly, Tucker countered, dropping her onto the bed. She bounced and came up, ready to leap off, but we stood on either side, blocking her. I don't want to be punished. She replied, wiping her hair out of her face. She was beautiful when she was riled, but that wouldn't keep her from learning her lesson. I didn't want to lose ten years of my life seeing you wave a gun in front of a madman, I said. I didn't want to find out you kept something so big, so dangerous a secret, Tucker added. I didn't want to discover you'd run off when you'd overheard something we could have easily talked through. Tucker crossed his arms over his chest. I didn't want to let your brother know we fucked you from behind. Tucker's last words took all the fight from her. She sank down on the bed, her shoulders drooping, her cheeks turning a fiery red. What you did was dangerous. Not just dangerous, but deadly, Tucker said. Are we talking about running away, riding to Butte on our own, or facing a lunatic? I asked. Tucker grunted. I'm sorry. I see I should have told you, she replied meekly. About what? Tucker asked. Everything. It's not just your husband's you scared. I paused, waiting for her to look up at me. Tears filled her eyes. The others here were worried, too. You lied to Anne, Tucker said, shaking his head. How many lies have you told, Abigail? Too many, she whispered, glancing down at her fingers clasped tightly in her lap. How were you punished, precious? Tucker tipped up her chin. You spank me. That's right, I said. You know how it's done. Tucker stepped back, waiting. Finally, she went to climb from the bed. We watched as she worked the buttons of her dress open and pushed it off her shoulders. The rest of her clothes followed. It was arousing to see her bare skin exposed bit by bit, and my cock hardened. But I wasn't ready to fuck her. Yet. Just like Tucker, I needed to spank her, to have her over my lap and take back control. We lost it the moment she'd ridden off. Hell, we hadn't had any control at all until she told us the entire truth. I settled onto the side of the bed, held out my hand. Tentatively, she placed her small one in mine and I pulled her over my lap, settling her so her head was close to the floor, her hair a wild tumble hiding her face. Her toes barely touched the wooden boards and her ass was upturned just right. You like when we fuck you, Abigail? I asked, stroking my hand over her silky skin, then gave her a firm spank. She stiffened, then murmured her reply. Yes? We push you, don't we? We take you hard and you love it. Spank. Why is that? I asked. She gasped at the power behind my palm that was quiet for a moment. This was a punishment and I would not go easy on her ass. Because... Because I know you're going to take care of me. Make me feel good. 
That's right, precious, Tucker said. And to do that, we need to know everything. What if we do something you don't like and you don't tell us? Spank. Then I won't feel good. I might get hurt. Exactly, I replied, giving her another swat. We see to all your needs, your happiness, your safety. We can't do our jobs when we don't know everything. We can't do our jobs when you lie, Tucker added. Spank. No more lies, I said. She shook her head, her hair swaying over the floor. No more lies, she repeated. I was done talking. I spanked her then, all over her bottom until not one spot wasn't a fiery shade of red. She'd stiffened and tried to buck away, used a hand to shield her bottom, but I took hold of it and kept it pinned behind her back. I didn't relent. Tucker squatted down so he was close to her head. Is there anything else between us, Abigail? He asked. I didn't stop the spanking as we waited for her to respond. Finally, she cried out. No, nothing else. Good, Tucker said. Then let's finish up your punishment so we can fuck you. Finally make you ours with nothing between us. No lies, no secrets, no blackmail. Abigail's entire body went slack then, giving over to the punishment. Perhaps she knew we needed to do this, to make sure she knew how out of control we felt, how painful and desperate it was when we had no idea where she was. Perhaps she knew the spanking was cathartic, cleansing, and once it was done, the wrongs would be forgiven. It would all be in the past. I finally stopped stroked over her heated flesh. Ten more from me, precious. Then we'll be done. Tucker spanked her then so she would know any consequence would be managed by both of us. When we were done, when her tears fell unabated, I pulled her up onto my lap. While she hissed against the contact of her ass against my thigh, she didn't complain. Part your thighs, I murmured, kissing her hair. She did as I asked immediately. Tucker stroked his fingers over her pussy, met my eyes. She's dripping wet. I grunted, gave her a squeeze even as she pulled her thighs together, pinning Tucker's hand in place. When she realized it was the opposite of what she wanted, she spread them again. Tucker grinned, lifted his slick fingers to his mouth and licked them clean. Perhaps that wasn't a punishment after all. Not if it made you all wet and aroused, I said. She shook her head brushed her hair back from her tear-stained face. I didn't like it. Your body says otherwise, but I'm glad you're so eager for us. Can you feel my cock? I asked. Shifting my hips, I pressed against her. My need for her couldn't be hidden. She nodded. Do you want our cocks? I asked. She nodded again. Both of them, at the same time. Tucker added. She looked up at Tucker. You mean one in my pussy and one in my ass? I almost came in my pants at her question. Yes. Tucker growled. Yes, she whispered. Tucker stepped back and I stood, turned around and tossed Abigail onto the bed. As my brother stripped off his clothes, I went to the dresser to grab the small jar of lubricant. While her pussy dripped copiously, her ass needed additional lubrication to take our cocks easily and with only pleasure. Although she discovered she liked a hint of pain with her fucking, it would not be this kind. Tucker climbed onto the bed, lay down on his back, and tugged Abigail on top of him. He stroked her dark hair back as it swung down over their faces. There's nothing between us now. No secrets. In just a minute, there will be nothing between our bodies either. Tucker kissed her then, and I heard her whimper. Dropping the jar onto the bed, I stripped and joined them stroked my hand down her spine. You're what connects us all, Abigail. We can't be a family without you. We can't be one without you. Abigail lifted her head as Tucker's hands moved to her hips, lifted her so she was just above his cock. Ride me, precious. Biting her lip, Abigail shifted a bit to align Tucker's cock with her entrance, then dropped down, taking him into her in one plunging stroke. Her head fell back her hair dangling long down her back. As I opened the jar and coated my fingers in the slippery substance, I watched them fuck. When Tucker pulled her back down for a kiss, I knew it was time to ready her. Placing my slick fingers at her tiny rosebud, I coated the virgin entrance with the lubricant, circling the tender flesh, then slowly pushing one finger in. Tucker continued to lift and lower his hips, 
fucking her with the short movements as they kissed, while I began to move my finger in and out of her tight ass. She gasped and moaned at the intrusion but didn't object. Because of this, I carefully added a second finger, scissoring them inside of her to stretch her open. My cock was thick, and I would go so deep, but the fingers were good preparation. I would ensure she was slick inside. When I added a third finger, Abigail cried out my name. I smiled. Like that? Yes, please, she begged. God, she was so fucking brazen. How would we ever imagined her to be timid or fearful when it came to something like this? She wanted it. No, by the way she was wiggling her hips, she needed it. She cried out when I slipped my fingers free. No! Shh! I crooned, dipping my fingers into the jar and coating my cock liberally with a lubricant. Eager, are you precious? Tucker asked, his voice rough. His hands came up and cupped her breasts, plucked at the tight tips. Tucker! She cried, thrusting forward so she filled his palms. Moving into place, I gripped the base of my cock and aligned it with her prepared and slick asshole. Pressing against it, she tightened, denying me entrance. Relax, I said, nudging her patiently. She would open for me. Perhaps a little pinch? Tucker asked, just before he tightened his grip on her nipples. Oh, God, she cried. She just got wetter. Tucker commented, pinching her again. She still wouldn't relent as I pressed against her. How about this? Tucker asked, bringing his palm down on her reddened bottom. It wasn't overly hard, but she stiffened between us. Fuck, she just about strangled my cock. That's not going to help me get into her, I replied. Mmm, Tucker said. Then how about this? I knew he touched her clit when I reached between them. All at once, her whole body went lax and I pressed once again. Slowly, she flowered open for me, stretching wider and wider for the flared head of my cock. With the slickness from the lubrication, it took just that little bit of relaxation to allow me entrance. I slipped inside, my cock head filling her. She groaned before she turned her head and looked at me over her shoulder. A fine sheen of sweat coated her skin, and her cheeks were beautifully flushed. Yes, I'm in. So full, she replied, and her eyes slipped closed as I pushed forward. She was so tight, like nothing I'd ever felt before. Through the thin membrane separating us, I could feel Tucker's cock moving in and out of her. Finding a rhythm, I slowly fucked her deeper and deeper until she took all of me. Only when she had every inch of me did I still. You're claimed, Abigail Landry, I said, kissing her shoulder. Ours. Tucker added. Nothing between us. Yours. She murmured, and I gave myself over to my wife. Gave her everything. Chapter 11 Abigail I was being fucked by both of my husbands. Together. At the same time. It wasn't Gabe in my mouth and Tucker in my pussy. They were filling my ass and pussy. I was so full I was overwhelmed. These men surrounded me filled me, claimed me. There wasn't an inch between us. They were mine. I was theirs. The feeling of taking both of them was so intense. I felt stretched, used, but the feelings their attentions brought about were worth it. Even the slight burning of being so open to them only added to the pleasure. Even my tingling sore bottom added to it. Each time Gabe shifted his hips, he bumped the tender flesh and when Tucker cupped my breasts and pinched my nipples. There wasn't one inch of me they didn't control, didn't pay attention to, didn't love. Somehow they knew exactly what I wanted, what I needed, and gave it to me. Taking them both like this was just as Gabe said. I was the one who connected the three of us. They were claiming me, but I was the one with the power. I was the center of it all. Without me, we were nothing. I understood then as they moved in and out of me, that I needed their punishments as well as their loving and their attention, stern or otherwise, was all because they loved me. They might be big brutes of men, but they had tender hearts, and I could wound them perhaps even more easily than they could me. I wanted this feeling, this need I had for them to last forever. It was my choice, 
I could be as I was now, between them, linking them, claiming them both, or I could live alone. I choose love. I choose pleasure. I choose them. And so I wiggle my hips. Not that I could do more than that impaled on two big cocks, letting them know I was ready for more. They'd held back and I knew it, but I could feel their desires were reined in. I want you, both of you. Don't hold back. Show me what's between us. Both stilled briefly. Then they took me then. Fucked me. Gabe slid out almost all the way as Tucker thrust his hips up and into me. Then they reversed the actions, fucking me in tandem. I couldn't hold off my pleasure. They were giving it to me, freely and happily. It was right there for me to take. And so with a deep breath, I let go, gave over to it, to them, completely. The pleasure coursed through me, heated me, swamped me, flooded me. I screamed my pleasure my inner walls tightening around on both of them, wanting them to feel how good it was and to help them along. I wanted to keep them deep inside, to milk their seed from them. It worked, for Tucker gripped my hips and came, filling me with his hot seed. Gabe was soon to follow, giving me every drop of his pleasure deep in my bottom. I'm yours, I murmured against Tucker's chest, too wilted to remain upright. Nothing between us, Tucker kissed my head as Gabe did my shoulder. Ours. I love you. I repeated, knowing the truth was so much better than any lie. This has been Their Brazen Bride, Bridgewater Menage, Volume 8. Written by Vanessa Vale. Narrated by Kylie Stewart. Copyright 2016 by Vanessa Vale. Production Copyright 2017 by Vanessa Vale. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.